read what is being said today if anybody needs that feature. So with that, I am going to, unless I forgot anything, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Susan to get us started. And thanks again so much for joining us today. Hi, welcome. This is Susan Berta. And Howard Garrett with Orca Network, co-founders. And I will give it back to Susan for the welcome to the welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We are so happy to have you all here. Um, this is our, our 18th annual Welcome the Whales and our second annual um, virtual Welcome the Whales. This, it's, it's, we're, we're getting better at the virtual part, but we're really hoping next year we will be back in person. Um, this is really one of our favorite events of the whole year because it's really a celebration um, and just the, the favorite part of it for me has always been the costume making workshop in the morning that many people don't even know about, but families from all over gather and we have supplies and bits of costumes for kids of all ages to make a costume and then be in the parade. And um, it's just always such a joyful event that we look forward to every year. And of course, this year is the most beautiful weather that we've ever had in 18 years for our Welcome the Whales. We've had rain, snow, gale force winds. Um, it always clears up just for the 10, 20 minutes of our parade and blessing. Um, so that's always been good. But today would have been a beautiful day to gather. And we appreciate those of you who have come inside on this beautiful day. Um, and we will be making the recording of today available um, on you, our YouTube channel, but, um, but it's more fun to be here in person. So we are really thankful that you are here with us. Um, and I would like to start with just an acknowledgement of our lands and waters of the Salish Sea and wherever you are joining us from. Um, the neat thing with with Zoom is that we have people join us from all over the world for our events. Um, so wherever you are, um, just take a moment to acknowledge and give thanks to those who came before you um, in, in where the lands that you live on. Um, for us on Whidbey Island, the Coast Salish tribes um, were here long before us um, and many different tribes of this region used the Whidbey Island lands and waters um, for different seasonal um, hunting and fishing. And um, there are villages and longhouses. Um, and in fact, next year, I'm hoping that Ray Freiberg from Tulalip will be able to join us at a live event to talk about a native village that's just on the north edge of Langley where the gray whales come to feed. Um, and in a moment, we will be showing a blessing video and the music for that. Um, I want to thank Ray Freiberg for um, its, um, his canoe family that um, has recorded a welcome song, which I thought was very appropriate for this. Um, but I just want to acknowledge the importance of the Native peoples and their knowledge of generations of living on the land and the water and having a very close relationship to it and stewardship of it. Um, it's something that we include in most of what we do and work with many of the different tribes in Washington and Canada um, in the projects that we're involved in. So um, I will move on to our blessing video. Um, we typically, when we do this event live, after the parade, we go down to the beach um, in front of Whale Bell Park and often have swimmers in the water, um, give an offering of flower petals to the whales, and we all just gather in a big crowd to welcome the whales. And once in a while, we're lucky enough to have the whales there um, for us to greet in person. Um, this year, we're, we're doing our blessing via a video. Um, so we'll just take a few moments to reflect on that.
Well, that gives us a moment to, to reflect how important it is um, to thank these gray whales. And that's why we started this event 18 years ago, because we feel so fortunate that we have this small, unique group of gray whales who come here each spring. And you'll learn more about them in the coming um, presentations. But we're really, really lucky. Not many places have gray whales that come and stay, um, and especially along the migration north. They're usually just passing by. Um, so we just feel so lucky and blessed to have these whales. And um, we feel fortunate that there are all of you out there who are interested in um, in the whales and learning more about them and caring for them and taking time out of a sunny day to be here. So now we'll shift from the more solemn blessing part to the fun part of this day, our famous most short parade in the world, <laughs> Welcome the Whales Parade. And we are really fortunate to have Jim Freeman, our parade master of all time, who has been with us throughout the years to, to narrate our parade and to help us with our beach ceremonies, which were often impromptu and as unpredictable as the whales showing up. So, um, <laughs> he's helped us through many of those um, situations and has been a wonderful, wonderful friend and um, conductor of fun. Um, so he will introduce the parade and you'll, you'll notice he's in the parade as well in a few key places. So Jim, you wanna introduce our parade? You bet, it's an honor, Susan. And thank you for your blessings and Howie and, and uh, the gray whales and the Native Americans. What a, what a powerful blessing that was. Um, it's my pleasure on this day in 2021 to introduce the world's finest and shortest virtual whale day parade. Let the fun <laughs> begin. Thank you. Felix, Felix, hold my hand.
Well, what do you think, Jim? Was that shorter than the usual shortest or about the... It was a lot easier on me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. I don't have to carry those heavy speakers around for you. <laughs> yeah. But Mark Wall and the, the wonderful uh, Whale Day Parade uh, percussionist, you know, that just energizes so much. And when they get started, you know, you could get to a bunch of misfits that didn't care and they'd be wound up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a great, great, uh, great to find that soundtrack and uh, add some of the parade ambiance to our virtual. Oh, I'm so program. glad you did because I, I just worked there. It was like we were still there, only we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like this whole last year or so, right? Really? <laughs> So what's um, next on the agenda, Susan? Well, I think we have um, Cindy is the virtual whale watch next. Well, Cindy gets a standing ovation over here for everything she's done since day one. Don't you agree, kids? I mean, <laughs> thank <on>. you. Yes. <laughs> Cindy is our Zoom queen and she, <laughs> Get her a t shirt. She, yeah, yeah. She's been amazing. And, you know, we've all learned a lot this last year. Um, and um, we're, we're still learning on these, um, these Zooms that we, it's, it's really weird because we were kind of forced into it. And actually, last Welcome the Whales was our very first Zoom event that we had ever done. Um, so we've learned a little bit since then, I think, <laughs> I hope. But um, it's there. we found many silver linings, let's put it that way, because we've had events where we have people from all over the world come and join us that couldn't join us in our live events. Um, so, um, so that's really cool. And, and we can record them and people can watch them later. So there, there are lots of, um, but we miss seeing everyone and being able to hug and, you know, show off our costumes and stand on the beach and joke with you. So um, it's been awesome having you here today and being part of our parade. And um, Cindy, who has it all together, has corrected me because I don't have the agenda in front of me. That next is actually a really cool new thing to Langley that had been planned to be part of last year's live Welcome the Whales event that couldn't happen because of COVID. Um, it did happen this past year, but not in person. So this is kind of our first unveiling, celebrating, um, the brand new wishing whale sculpture that is in Langley in Whale Bale Park um, by the famous sculptor Georgia Gerber, who we are very, very fortunate to have um, living in Langley. Um, and if any of you are artists or not and have tried to make a beautiful gray whale, it's one of the most difficult animals to make appear beautiful and graceful. I mean, they're, they're amazing, wonderful animals, but, you know, humpbacks are much more graceful and easy to make artistic. And, and Georgia did an amazing job on this sculpture. And it's also a bank, so it collects money for improvements to Whale Bell Park and the waterfront park that we hope to add more interpretation and whale viewing areas to. So we have a little video coming up um, with the people involved in making the wishing whale possible. And we hope you can all come to Langley and see that. And next year we can um, do another in-person um, ceremony for the wishing whale when we're all there after the parade. I'm Tim Callison. I'm the mayor of Langley, and I'm a very fortunate individual because there are so many elements in this town that are iconic and precious and creative and full of energy, 
And this particular project brought together three of our most precious uh, elements of this town. Number one, the whales that come and feed on our shore annually that are out here that you can see from Seawall Park. Number two, a, a very, very talented uh, uh, artistic community, and Georgia Gerber is one of those members of that community in there. If you do come visit, there's art all over the town, both by Georgia and others. And our third element that helped create this uh, very, very uh, unique whale is the fact that we have the Whale Center, part of the Orca Network here in town. We have the Whale Museum, and all those three elements together uh, came together in order to inspire our Langley Arts Fund to create this wonderful piece by uh, raising donations from the community. And then the artist, Georgia Gerber, did an exceptional job of interpreting what a gray whale looks like uh, swimming gracefully through the sea. So this is the, the now famous wishing whale <laughs> sculpture in Langley. And um, this all started a couple of years ago when a group of us um, from the Langley Arts Commission started thinking about Seawall Park and really connecting downtown Langley with its waterfront. Right now there's a steep bluff there and we wanted to start the process of, of getting Langley back to its historical roots of the water. And we thought, um, being from the Arts Commission, that one of the best ways to that would be um, an iconic piece of art. And um, we had split off and started a group called the Langley Arts Fund. And we decided that our first project would be a whale. So I started out with the idea of the whale, the, 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 the form of the whale feeding or diving down. Um, and I did just a little small maquette and presented that to the committee um, in that, you know, I think it was January 2020 or 19. Um, um, and then from there, the idea got approved. So then I had to enlarge it up to, um, with a company to a, a larger version, which the computer um, um, scanned my little maquette and created a, a blue styrofoam for me. So that came to the studio, and that had to be reclayed, reclayed, covered, and then also that long process of trying to make this gray whale graceful, beautiful, elegant, and still keep the form of it. I had all of the, this material, books, measurements, um, but I, as I've said before, you know, the gray whale tapers here, tapers there, not much different than a slug with flippers. And so you just had, I just had to allow myself to keep pushing that form to find that grace. Um, and it, it went on and on. And, um, but I got there. <laughs> I'm really happy with it. And um, Brandy can attest to that. Um, but so then that six foot actually got to seven and a half feet before I had to slice and dice to create a little more elegance here, or whatever. I just changed that original um, form. And then it went down to uh, a foundry in Eugene, or more complicated than that, but basically they, everything got enlarged to the fuller scale uh, based on that, what was a six foot, now a seven and a half foot locket that went down south. Randy can help with that a little bit more in the process, so, but. Oh, well, with Georgia, the final piece that we had here on Whitby was a six foot version of this. And she's saying it got to seven feet because when she saw it at six feet, uh, the proportions weren't quite right for her, so we ended up having to manipulate that somewhat. But in the end, she ended up with a six foot version, which is half scale. And then that was scanned and uh, used uh, 3D printing to print out each of large sections of that at a larger scale so that when those sections got cast, and welded back together and created this, this 12 foot piece. And that's how that was done in the foundry. And uh, it was quite sophisticated. One of the things along the way was, uh, this is one of, actually one of George's first pieces that was fully engineered. He had uh, the, the, uh, 
the engineering figure out why because of the angles of the way the base is holding it, I wanted to make sure that if there's a lot of weight out on the tail or in any kind of earthquakes or wind and whatnot, that, that it could support itself well. So there's a whole lot of uh, inner structure made out of stainless steel that's inside this thing, hold it up. The, uh, the engineer that inspected it uh, wrote that uh, he thought we could probably park a small truck on the back end, it would be okay. So <laughs> we, know, we know it's gonna hold up. How do you feel about your contribution to life in Langley, beautifying our town? You know, it, it's interesting. At, at first, when I was approached, I had so many other pieces here. I thought maybe there should be another artist or go, you know, I was trying to um, maybe redirect a little bit. But now I just, I just feel so honored that I was chosen and that I was able to have this year to do this piece. Um, it was, it might be my swan song, I don't know. I don't know how much I'll do another big commission like this now, but um, it was um, it was a good turning point in my life where uh, my grandsons are here, they come to Langley all the time. It just felt like I wanted to be a part of the generations. I wanted to honor the species that are out there um, and their hope for their culture, and it just was a huge, huge honor. And I didn't get it at first until I was way into the project and I started to see the, the multiple levels of that impact and um, maybe, maybe work even harder. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was an important piece of my life on a lot of levels. One of the requests for the uh, for the whale was, of course, to make it into a wishing whale so that there'd be a, a way to, to drop money in. And so the blowholes presented the obvious place to do that. Uh, unlike a piggy bank, though, they're not, it's not raised up and obvious. So a lot of people, I think, don't see that. It's mentioned on the sign. But I would like to demonstrate that this is where the, this is where the coins go. And that you probably can't hear, but we had a fun idea at the end there's a chute that the money falls down and goes into a basket inside the base. And uh, I realized that, that we could uh, line up a bell in there. So when you drop a coin in, that little, little, the bell goes off nicely. And that, that... Okay, so that is our new wishing whale. We are so lucky to have that. And I forgot to mention some of you um, who may not know Georgia Gerber likely know some of her work. Um, if you've ever been to Langley, you've seen the boy and dog at the boy and dog park, the uh, beautiful bunnies and all sorts of wonderful animals she has sculpted. But I think one of her most famous in this region is Rachel the pig at Pike Place Market, um, who is also a piggy bank. So that's kind of uh, the idea of that. Um, piggy bank um, is where the, the wishing whale bank idea came from. Um, and we, again, we're just so, so honored to have her among our community and to have this beautiful whale 
um, bracing Whale Bell Park. And there is now, we can say in Langley, there are um, guaranteed whale sightings. Anytime you come to Langley, you're going to see a gray whale. Um, so thank you, Georgia, for that. And thank you to all who are tuning in today. Um, so far I've seen, we have people from um, California and Ontario and the UK. Um, I know we had one of our um, parade entrants was from Germany. Um, so it's really great to have people from all over join us today. So um, we're gonna move on to a little um, education about these whales that we're celebrating today. Um, we're really, um, fortunate to have Cindy Hansen, our education coordinator, talk to us about the gray whales, um, which she has studied and um, had in her life for many decades. So we will do a short video about that um, coming up next. And I want to thank Amanda, who is manning our um, video part of our Zooming today and getting everything queued up and playing. Um, and we always uh, have to kind of see who has the best internet. Um, and she's always been great at this. So thank you. And also in the background, um, Elisa Lemire Brooks, our sighting network coordinator, um, has been working hard to make the um, some of our welcome and ending screens and um, Unfortunately, having to deal with the bots that um, spam our Facebook pages when we post a link to a Zoom webinar. So um, she's been working hard in the background doing that so we can enjoy this event um, without being intruded upon. Um, so thank you, Cindy, for getting this video together. And um, we're ready for that one now, Amanda.
All right. Thank you, Cindy, so much for that great educational video. Um, and as the slide said, we will be learning more about the Sounders and some of the latest research um, that they were doing um, this week and as of this morning. Um, so we're really lucky to have some great researchers who have been studying these whales. Uh, John Kalambakitis of Cascadia Research has been tracking and observing and researching our sounders, gray whales since 1990. Um, so um, it's really a special population to have a lot of good information about. Um, and we'll learn more of that shortly. Um, and I also wanted to, to mention and thank um, Howard Garrett and Cindy Hansen for their help in the videos today that we've been showing. Um, there are great video editors um, and have been able to match the music to the, the pictures and the soundtracks and everything, um, no easy task. So um, we really appreciate all their help. Um, and all of our amazing staff here at Orca Network. Um, I just want to take a quick minute to mention that we have many different projects. People often think we're just a whale sighting network or um, we have the Lolita campaign to bring Tokitai back from Miami. Some people know us for that. Some people know us for the Langley Whale Center. Um, some people know us because when they find some dead stinky marine mammal on their beach, they can call us and we'll come and figure out what happened um, for our stranding network. And of course our whale sighting network and many amazing educational projects um, that we do. Um, a lot of them, all of them virtually this year um, that we're, we're just so, amazed and proud of what Orca Network has grown into these last 20 years. Um, you know, we just started as a very small organization, which is Howard and I um, tracking the whales and trying to bring Lolita home and it's just blossomed. Um, and we are just honored that so many people are interested in the whales and have become a part of Orca Network. And one of the most important parts of Orca Network that helps us do what we do is all of you who are also volunteers. Um, we have many volunteers working at the Langley Whale Center, which has now reopened um, after some COVID closures. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering, we have lots of opportunities um, and you can email us at info at orcanetwork.org or um, go to our website. Um, and we do have a new website coming. It's getting closer um, and it will better reflect all of the work we do in our different projects. Um, okay, so I think next we have a short whale watch, uh, virtual whale watch. Um, Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Um, you are correct. Okay. Yes. Apologies. I didn't print out the agenda. Um, one of those days, but um, we, in the past few years, we've been able to do a gray whale watch in person as a fundraiser to help fund our welcome the whales program. Um, but this year we couldn't do that. And Cindy and um, Jill Hine, a board member and volunteer, you've seen many of her photos in some of our videos, um, went out and did a great virtual whale watch for us. So um, sit back, put your life jacket on and enjoy meeting some of the gray whales. for joining our Welcome the Whales Festival. My name is Cindy Hansen. And I'm Jill Hine. We have our gray whale ID guide handy and we are going to take you on a virtual whale watch. Before heading out in the boat to look for gray whales, we decided to do a short side trip and check on our local celebrity elephant seal, Ellie, and her new pup. 
This is the fourth baby she has given birth to on the shores of Whidbey Island. Everyone thinks this one is a boy because of the shape of his nose, but we don't have confirmation of that yet. He has tentatively been named Elwood. When we arrive, they seem to be having a lazy morning and are taking a nap. Ellie will remain here with her pup and won't go to sea until he is weaned, which can sometimes be up to a month. And from all accounts, he is getting more active and feisty every day, so she's probably appreciating a little quiet time. As Elwood starts to wake up a bit, he begins practicing the fine art of flipping sand on himself. Elephant seals do this to cool themselves while on land. Eventually, he starts to wriggle around, and when he rolls over, we're able to confirm that this is indeed a male pup. So, Elwood it is. We leave the elephant seals and head out in the boat from Langley, where a few gray whales have been spotted a short time earlier. Captain Clarence takes us out to Hat Island while we look for blows, but there's a bit more wind and waves than we had anticipated, and viewing is a challenge. Finally, Clarence spots a blow, and we head over to find two of our local sounders. Our gray whale ID expert, Jill, compares her photos with the ID guide created by Orca Network and Cascadia Research. By looking at the shape of the dorsal ridge and the pattern of spots, she is able to confirm that one of these whales is number 383, a male who has been coming to Puget Sound to feed since 1999. His companion is a little harder to identify. He or she never arches the back, and we're only able to see the front part of the body. So the identity of this whale still remains a mystery to us. After a few more minutes of viewing and a lovely look at 383's tail flukes, we decide to leave and head into Saratoga Passage for some calmer water and to look for another gray whale that was spotted earlier off Camino Island. On the way, we decide to stop and check in on Elwood's big brother, Ellison, who was Ellie's first pup born in 2015. He is currently undergoing his catastrophic molt, and we make sure to keep an extra distance so we don't disturb him. While most mammals shed fur year-round, elephant seals molt their fur and upper layer of skin all at once, and it's one of the few times of the year when they come on shore. After we leave Ellison, we continue looking for the gray whale that had been reported earlier, and we're in contact with friends who are looking from shore, but we still don't see any sign of this whale. We cross to Camano Island and check along the shoreline of Elger Bay. Not seeing anything, we decide to make our way back to Langley when we see a report that a gray whale was seen in Elger Bay just minutes earlier. What? How did we miss a 45-foot animal? We turn around and very slowly move through the area and continue searching, but still don't see a blow. Uh, Clarence, where's this whale? And then suddenly there she is. We see the telltale heart-shaped blow of a gray whale surfacing close to shore. We watch as she rolls over to her right side and begins feeding in the mud. Gray whales are bottom feeders, filtering small prey items through their baleen. The Sounders gray whales are a special group who have learned a risky feeding technique of coming into the mud flats at high tide and feeding on ghost shrimp. This whale is in less than 10 feet of water, and you can see her pectoral fin and tail fluke out of the water as she filters through the mud. When she surfaces again, Jill is able to get a photo of her back for identification. I think so. Who is it, Jill? Uh, that appears to be 531. The whale is number 531, a female who has been coming to feed here since 2000. We watch for several more minutes as she continues to feed in the mud. This is an encouraging sign. Gray whales are currently undergoing an unusual mortality event that has already claimed almost 25% of the population. Many of the whales who have died showed signs of starvation, so the ghost shrimp here in Puget Sound are incredibly important to these Sounders gray whales, and maybe what is helping to sustain them and keep them alive during this rough time.
the sun starts to dip low in the horizon, we decide that it's time to head back to the Langley Marina. So we take a last look at number 531 and wish her happy feeding. As we start to slowly motor away, she leaves us with a beautiful heart-shaped glow as a parting gift. Thank you for joining us to come out and see the Sounders Gray Whales. Hope you had fun. We did. Hopefully next year we'll be doing this in person. Until then, enjoy the rest of the festival. Bye. Bye. and downs you stayed my friend you're always there like you always can Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Hi, John. John Kalamakitis has joined us and John Durbin. Um, we are going to, we just had a little virtual whale watch. Um, so we're kind of drying off and taking off our life jackets now. And um, we've been going for about an hour. So we were going to take a short break and um, while we're doing our little little break um we'll show a video that was taken by john gusman um last year when we went to san ignacio lagoon um this is the trip we've done every year except this year um and it's an amazing um special place as cindy has shown in her her earlier video um so if you uh, we'll, we'll be showing that, and if you need to get up and refresh your coffee or um, just stretch a little, um, we'll get our John and John and Holly um, um, set up and ready to do um, the wonderful, most important part of our program, which is learning about the latest research um, on our gray whales here. Um, so thanks to them for all, all for joining us and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, enjoy the video, it's about a 10 minute break and um, we'll watch Whales in Baja for a few minutes and then get on to our feature presentations. Thanks so much. I was telling to some of you guys early, due to the high salinity and the high winds, high uh, speed winds, winds in this uh, area, 
Uh, very few plants actually make it. The ones who make it are adapted to it and uh, they're very effective. You're gonna see a bunch of the same all over the place. We have uh, something that looks like Ocotillo, which is called Adam's tree. Um, I will explain to you a few little things like where, so, so everything here has to be either recycled, reused, separated. Outrageous. This is such an incredible experience. That's, like no experience. other yeah. on yeah. earth. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's very kind of uh, enjoyable. Where they, it's perfect. For all ages. For for all ages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even mine. Yeah. We all cry when we see the whales. Getting to go out and, well, of course with the whales, but the nature hikes and the tidal pool was so interesting. But the people have been marvelous. We've been taken care of so well. They're so accommodating. It's just a wonderful trip. We have some, uh, the lower jaw, which is that one that is there, mm -hmm. and the other one that is in the corner, the two oh. lower jaw. Mm -hmm. I have a picture here because oh, you can have a better guess of how. Oh. The story of the camp is uh, a story of uh, two friends, Maldo and Johnny, and uh, Johnny Friday is, uh, is, uh, is an American, turned into Mexican, uh, and uh, Maldo is a rancher turned into a fisherman. Well, I think the only, the only thing I can say about what the real feelings, a lot of emotions will come out of this. They're gonna fall in love with this place. So I think that's the greatest goal of the camp, to create a bond with these creatures, to create a bond with nature, to create a, a bond of respect, a bond of love. The connection you make with that whale out there, they will never forget that. It's a time where we need to, to love nature a little more. And uh, I think it was Alan Watts said, uh, we are to the world what the apple is to the apple tree. Touch the baby! That's it, he's pushing the boat. He's pushing the boat! <laughs> Look, you see that? You see that? It's The mangroves are a really important part of the ecosystem here because they provide a, a nursery for the small fish that are that are here in the lagoon. So they say that they say a third of their lives in the in the mangroves getting bigger before they go back out to sea. They also provide a really rich habitat for the birds, um, the turtles, um, the other wildlife that are here in the lagoon. Uh, they are also 
The red mangroves have these really deep prop roots, it's called, roots that go right down into the sand and they actually provide almost like a, like a buffer for the land erosion or the wind erosion. So you see the, the red mangroves there, they're sort of scattered all over the, the sides of the lagoon and different areas of the lagoon. We also have the white mangroves as well. They have a slightly different uh, root system than the red mangrove and they protect them here because they're so important to the ecosystem. I think it's the million dollar question always as to why are the whales coming so close to the boat and uh, it's one of those beautiful things that I don't, it can never be fully definitely answered and I think that's the beauty of it because it's still a little bit of mystery. From the minute that these the babies are born they're using their sensory, little sensory hairs in their chin to move down mom's body to find the milk and they're always constantly touching the social behavior that goes on they're constantly rubbing and playing and who knows what they think of us but they seem to sort of gravitate sometimes over to us uh, in a curious kind of way and actually when they come over and there's all these hands wanting to touch and, and you can see them actually kind of like closing their eyes and, and enjoying it and turning upside down and the lovely thing is we're going out in these little skiffs so you're very very close to the water and uh, and you don't need much more it's that kind of harmony i think between between the, the the people who live here and the the whales who also live here for a period of time the trips you know the whale watching trips every time you go out it's so different to the last one you know and i guess that's what keeps it so exciting is because you never know you never actually know what you're going to get so you know, for us, each day is just as an exciting one as the new one. All right, I hope everyone had a chance to stretch a little and also catch some of that amazing video. We were really lucky um, that John Gusman, who's an amazing videographer, he did Return of the River about the Elwha River um, and has done some great video work um, over the years. So he was able to go to our, join us on our Baja trip last year and um, was able to capture what that experience is like. Um, if you're interested in joining us, we are taking names for next March. Um, if, if you're interested in coming to Baja with us, um, it really gives you a different experience. And um, for me anyway, it, it made me think about gray whales in a totally different way. Um, their behavior is down in the mating and um, birthing lagoons are so different than what we see up here where they're really focused on food. Um, so um, just great to kind of add to your knowledge of gray whales. Um, 
And oh, I also wanted to mention, we do have that on our Orchid Network YouTube channel, um, as well as a lot of other videos, our Ways of Wales workshops, and um, many other wonderful educational things. So check that out. Um, we will move on to our webinar uh, educational part of the day. Um, or if we were doing this in person, we would all be running from the parade and blessing back up to the church and uh, cleaned up all the costume mess <laughs> and get the chairs set out and ready for our presentation as uh, John Kalamakitas has, has been a part of many times. Um, so this way we just change the screen and uh, move on to our different speakers joining us from different places. Um, we're going to start with um, John Durbin of Southall Environmental Associates and Holly Fernbach of SR3. They have done some amazing photogrammetry work um, with both orcas and gray whales and likely many other species. Um, and we learned so much from that different perspective. Um, and this year it's been really exciting to see some of the research they've done with the Sounders gray whales. Um, and um, it just really adds to the work that, that John Callum, Bakitas and Cascadia Research have been doing. Um, so um, we're gonna start with John and Holly talking um, about and showing some of their work with the Southern resident orcas. Um, then we'll have John Callum Bakitas talk about gray whales and go back to John and Holly for more of their drone work with the great whales. All right, are you guys all set up and are you joining us from Stewart Island today? We are, can you hear us okay? Yeah, yes. yeah. Great, okay, good. Um, yeah, wave your hands or send a chat if, 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 if we go offline, but yep, we are, we're here and uh, really pleased to be joining you. It's been several years since I was uh, over there and gave a talk in person at this workshop, so it's been too long. So um, it's great to see so many familiar faces. Um, let me try and share my screen here. And uh, let me see, can you see, uh, can you see a slide yes. with a bunch of killer whales? Yes. <laughs> okay, Looks great. Um, perfect. So yeah, I've, I've minimized the videos just so I can see my screen. So if, um, yeah, do, do send a chat if you can't, can't hear me or if I go offline. But um, yeah, thanks again for having us. Um, Holly and I are going to do a, a bit of a double act over the next 25 or 30 minutes and talk about, I'm going to talk a bit about photogrammetry in general, but also specifically about the work we're doing on Southern Resident Killer Whales. And that might seem a bit of a, a departure from, from the main theme of, of this event on gray whales, but I promise you it isn't. It's, it's meant to be a bit of a primer in terms of what's possible and, and, and what we're trying to do with the sounders also. So I'll come back and kind of close the loop after John talks later. So we'll kind of bookend the, the bit on gray whales with, with some photogrammetry. Um, this just as an example, as a, a, Susan talked about the perspective, I'm continually blown away by this amazing perspective we get um, uh, fr from the air. And this is, this is J-Pod um, on Salmon Bank a few years ago. And it just, just reminds me how spectacular these animals are. Let me see if I can. Okay, so where are we? Um, this little arrow shows where we are. Um, Holly and I live on Stewart Island in the northern San Juans. Um, although uh, we've been con conducting research here for a long time, uh, 28 years in my case, it doesn't feel that long. Um, we just relocated here a couple of years ago full time so that we could be even more effective in, in monitoring the health, particularly of Southern residents. Um, and to really, we're really indebted to, to conducting science to, to help management and recovery of this special population. So hopefully hopefully we're helping and, and uh, I want to, out, to lay out some of the ways we're trying to do that. Um, for those of you who don't know us, this is us um, holding a big drone. This is Maximus, one of our octocopter drones, and he really does the heavy lifting, literally. Um, what we're going to talk about today is photogrammetry, and Holly will describe much of what we get out of these kind of aerial images. I want to talk to you mostly about how and why we obtain these images. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is give the whales a health check, but do it non-invasively. Now, we're, all whales are large. Blue whales are the largest animals that ever live on the planet, but even killer whales are large. They're, although they're not a true whale or the largest dolphin, they're too large to handle. Um, this is a, a dead killer whale in the Canadian Arctic, and I think it just shows the scale and size of these animals. So if we want to assess their health, we really have to have a practical and non-invasive way to do that. 
Um, and uh, our development of photogrammetry as that practical and non-invasive way really tells the story of kind of our careers, but also the need to assess the health of Southern residents. Um, as we all know, Southern resident killer whales are a species in the spotlight. They've been designated that by NOAA Fisheries because not only are they on the endangered species list, but we're not meeting recovery goals. Um, they're also a species in the spotlight because of their urban nature. And they can be regularly seen from urban centers like Seattle here. This is K21 in front of the Seattle waterfront. They can be seen from Victoria, Vancouver. So um, they're very visible. Um, that visibility and accessibility has led to them being the most the, or the best studied killer whale population in the world, thanks mostly to the great work that, that Ken Balcom and, 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 and his folks have done over the last almost uh, five decades now. Um, but this urban nature also puts them at risk. They're at risk from anthropogenic activities and, and they live in our backyard. Um, they have a checkered history with, with people. Um, early, you know, they, they were seen as pests by fishermen and shot at. Um, they were captured for display in public aquaria. This is actually a picture of in the 1970s of, of the first killer whale Moby doll being harpooned for display at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, as you all know, in the 1960s and 70s, a large proportion of the population was removed or captured. Um, only one of them remains, Tokate, Lolita, the Miami Sea Aquarium, as, as, as you guys all know. And this was the story I knew when I started my career um, as a research assistant with Ken at the Center for Whale Research in the early 1990s, 20, 27, 28 years ago. Um, at that time, the Southern resident population had been increasing since, since the 1970s, um, increased from about 70 whales up to almost 100 whales. Oh, and things were good. Um, believe it or not, this is me at the bottom doing photo ID at the Center for Whale Research. And um, I'll try, if I was there in person, I'd try to convince you that I haven't changed a bit, but unfortunately that's not the case. Um, so at that time, it was a wonderful place to be, a wonderful population to study. We all felt pretty good about this recovering population. Um, I learned the value of being able to recognize individuals and track individuals, again, thanks to, to Ken's pioneering work. Um, thanks to the photo ID technology, um, we were able to track individuals, population size, genealogies, age, genders. This is K-12 and K-22, two beautiful K-pop whales. Um, but things changed, and things changed in the mid to late 1990s when we started to see whales that look like this. Um, this is what we call peanut head, where the head appears very pronounced when they surface, and that's because they don't have much subcutaneous fat, not much fat under the skin, so you can see the shape of their skeleton beneath the skin. So we started seeing a number of whales like that that really precipitated a population decline in the late 1990s. Um, they really undid most of the gains they had, they, they had achieved through population growth in the previous two decades. In the early 2000s, they were listed as um, endangered under the Species at Risk Act in Canada, the Endangered Species Act in the US. There are currently 75 whales, you know, really as low an abundance as there have been since just after the captures. So recovery is not being met, the population is not doing well. Um, a seminal paper for me in the scientific literature came from, from our great friend and colleague John Ford, who showed that um, during that period of decline in the 1990s, not only did southern resident killer whales decline, but not their neighbors to the north, northern resident killer whales declined in abundance. And that coincided with a with a sharp decline in the abundance of their main prey, Chinook salmon, um, on, on the coast in general. And it was really the first time we got an evidence that this population or both populations may well be, be food limited. Um, we now know, thanks to really a, a couple more decades of very intensive research, that the, these, these whales are salmon specialists. They don't just like salmon, they like big Chinook salmon. And when you're a specialist, you're very vulnerable to what's going on in the food chain beneath you, um, and 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 really, your, you know, yeah, you, all your eggs are in one basket, so to speak. And so, this is what makes the southern residents very very vulnerable. Um, and repeatedly, since that paper came out, and, and even before, there were questions about whether this population in general are, are starving to death. And this is the backdrop whereby we wanted to develop methods to see if whales were starving, to see if they were nutritionally stressed before they die, to see if we could do something about it, inform our management colleagues in DFO and NOAA at WDFW to help find creative management solutions before whales die. In 2008, uh, for Holly's PhD work, we collaborated to, to first of all use a helicopter platform to fly high um, a thousand feet above the whales with a permit from National Marine Fisheries Service to collect aerial images from above the whales. Um, we did that again in 2013 when we could get some funding to do that again. And Holly's going to talk to you a lot more about what we got from the, the, these kind of data. 
Of course, recently we've been able to transition from using manned aircraft to using custom-made research drones. Um, in this case, this is a hexacopter. It has six motors. It's whisper quiet. We designed them to be whisper quiet. Um, we have specialist photographic equipment so that we have undistorted photographs. Um, and really, it's, it's been a game changer for us doing photogrammetry. It's allowed us to be non-invasive, to fly the camera lower over the whales whilst them still not realizing it's there, to be more cost effective, and to be safer without putting scientists in aircraft. We flew the first flights ever of drones over whales for scientific use in 2014. Shortly afterwards, I talked at your Way of the Whales workshop, I think in uh, spring 2015, and showed you some of the video and photographs we took during that time. We worked with our colleague Lance Bar Barrett Leonard from the Vancouver Aquarium and, and, um, and worked on northern resident killer whales that year. Um, we were blown away by the quality of images we obtained. I think we, we were all ready for this, this technique being um, cheaper, more, more effective. We could line the weather with the whales up better. We didn't have to schedule helicopter time. But we hadn't really realized that by flying a camera several hundred feet lower over the whales, the images would be so much better. And clearly, this is the A42 match line of northern resident killer whales. And clearly, you can see that we can delineate the size and shape of these whales. And we can get some wonderful quantitative metrics of their health that, that Holly will talk about. I think the thing that is most has greatest utility for us is this is a totally non-invasive science. Um, because we want non-distorted images, flat images, not like this kind of GoPro video you see, we use a long lens. That means we want to fly high so we can fit the whale in the frame. And that has the other advantage. We, we fly over 100 feet high, often 150 feet above the whale. The whale does not know that our quiet custom-made drone is there. But similarly, our, our research boat can be several hundred yards away from the whales. So we're giving them a health check while being completely non-invasive. I think it's important to say that we do this entirely with, with research permits and flight authorizations from the FAA. Um, these, the FAA do class drones as aircraft. Uh, NOAA fisheries require any aircraft over under a thousand feet over a whale to have a, a scientific research permit or a filming permit. So the weight of the uh, paperwork to get permitted for what we do weighs just about as much as the drones. And I think it's important to, to keep our footprint small uh, around these whales. After our initial uh, successful application, we've, we've taken the show on the road. We, we, we've done a number of studies around the world, but particularly we started our long-term study or continued our long-term study and photogrammetry to assess the health of Southern residents. Um, and for that, one of the interesting technical advances we made is to get bigger. You know, most, a lot of the time with technology, you want to get small and make everything minuscule. Well, in our case, by being met, bigger makes us less invasive. This octocopter drone with eight motors that we use um, is really quiet because it's using eight motors and big propellers that spin slowly rather than a fewer number of motors that spin really fast and make more noise. Um, it allows us to carry a much bigger camera, a full frame camera, um, but and also allows us to fly from further away. So we're typically a few to several hundred yards away from the whales and can be completely non-invasive. The octocopter with Holly holding it, it's 42 inches across. On the right, we've got J22 um, and, and 38 in, in the Strait of Georgia a couple of years ago. You can see the drone over the whales, about 150 feet up. And this was taken from the boat where I'm flying that was 400 yards away. So that's, we, we really like being able to lessen our footprint around these whales, but increase the quality of our data collection. Very quickly, the way we do this is we want to know the size, the width or the length of a whale. Um, to do that, we need to know our altitude and we have very precise um, laser altimeters on our aircraft that estimate our altitude to within millimeters. Um, we need to know the focal length of our lens. Um, and then we need to know, then we can project the image onto the sensor of the camera and we can multiply out by to real, real size of the animal knowing the dimensions of the sensor. So photogrammetry is, is very precise, uh, very quantitative. Um, the other thing we do is we have our, the cameras on our drones gimbaled to point directly downwards. If you look at the uh, schematic on the left, you can see that if we're not directly overhead of the whale, we get distortion um, on the plane of the, the water's surface. So what we want is to be completely vertical over the whale so we can have a completely undistorted frame to have very precise measurements so we can assess differences, for example, in the width of a whale in just a few centimeters between seasons or years to assess their health. We know our system's very precise. Um, this is a, actually an, an old uh, um, slide. We routinely photograph ground uh, resolution targets to do to, when we practice. Um, these lines are at known separation, so we can see what kind of distances we can resolve 
even without the smaller cameras we used to use from 100 feet up or 30 meters, um, we can resolve distances as small as 1.4 centimeters, um, fractions of an inch. Now with bigger cameras, we can resolve from, from 100 feet up, we can resolve less than half a centimeter. That means that's the distance we can tell differences in whale condition or length. So it's a very, very precise technique. Um, our results, in order to be used, we've got to have scientific robustness. We've published a number of papers and continue to do this. Holly will refer to a number of these that have been published in scientific literature. Um, we continue to, to want to test our approach, apply it to different scenarios, but particularly to continue it in our long-term studies of Southern residents. Um, we do photogrammetry all over the world, in Antarctica, on killer whales and humpback whales, um, in the tropics on beaked whales. Uh, but our main studies are on killer whales in this part of the world, and now um, the sound is grey whales. So I'm going to hand over to Holly now to talk a bit more about what we've learned from our photogrammetry on southern resident killer whales, and then later on I'm going to come back and talk specifically about the sounders uh, grey whale photogrammetry study once you've got a bit more of a primer and the kind of work we can do with photogrammetry. So I'll hand over to Holly. Can I just check you can all hear me? Can someone just give me a yes or no and then, then we'll move on? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Okay. I'm going to minimize our video again and hand over to Holly. So thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. This is actually my, my first time talking to this group. So um, it's exciting. And thanks again for the invitation. And as John said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the kind of nitty gritty of, of um, the data that we collect. Well, we can collect more than a thousand images um, just from a single flight. And so uh, it takes us, you know, can take us up to six months to, to process a full season of our, our research. And I um, can talk to you a little bit more about all of that. So we're now in the 14th year of our study. And as John mentioned, we're now living on, on Stewart Island. We recently relocated from Southern California. So we're able to extend our monitoring um, to year round, uh, which is really important. And I'll talk to you about some of the specifics of that. Oops, hold on. Just hit the right button. Oops, sorry, we're having a bit of a difficulty. Huh. It was working for me. I'll oh, just hit the hit the space. Let me go forward. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not a I'm not a Mac person here. So, um, uh, specifically photogrammetry. Um, you've mentioned um, John mentioned that a number of times. It's it's very simply the science of making measurements from photos. So we showed you some of the other images. What we really want is collect to collect images like this. You can see the the full profiles of the individuals. You can see there's beautiful water clarity. You can see all the edges. And so we really need this kind of images to make the full um, suite of measurements that we collect. Um, and one of the things that he also mentioned um, is that we are able to track these individuals. Um, and so one of the reasons that we're able to do that is because of the more than 40 years work of the Center for Whale Research and the monitoring of the, the population. So one of the things that we needed to determine first was that we could in fact link our aerial images and the measurements that we collect to known individuals of age, known age and sex. So you could see here are two aerial images on the top you can see there's, there's pronounced saddle pigmentation here. And we can link them to the boat-based images and then the catalog that's been maintained by the Center for Well Research again for more than 40 years now. So this is really important. And, and John's going to talk about this with the, the Sounders gray whales as well, is that these, these measurements that we collect, we can link them to individuals, which is really important um, to see how individuals, females change over time, males change over time. Um, and we're really interested in, in monitoring how these individuals growth uh, as well as their body condition. So this just shows you a, another example image. We actually collect dozens of dozens of Im, um, measurements from each image, but this just shows you just a few examples. Uh, you can see the, the body length theory. You can also see the lines along the body axis showing these condition profiles. And again, I think it's up to about 50 some measurements that we can get from, from a single image. And John mentioned the, the northern resident population to so the, the northerly group of um, fish eating killer whales. And we were really interested in when we started our drain research of uh, starting a comparative study uh, with our photogrammetry work. So we wanted to see how the condition of northern residents compares to the southern residents. So here you can see two maps showing the, the range of both the northern and the southern residents and the established um, critical habitat that you could see in the, the yellow here. Uh, you can see kind of the orangey shows the 
northern um, killer whale resident range, and then the green shows the southern um, killer whale resident range. And typically, uh, you see those northern residents uh, occurring mostly at the northern end of the Vancouver Island, where the southern residents spend most of their time on the southern end. And we are expecting because the northern residents um, get that that first. Um, go at the, the fish coming down from Alaska, the Chinook, that we would see a, a healthy um, population body condition wise, um, potentially larger animals, more robust. Um, but one of the things we we're actually surprised with what we found, and I'm going to step through going back to southern residents a little bit from some of my PhD work. Um, but I mentioned that we are interested in monitoring growth, um, and to do that, we have to be able to estimate the size of the individuals. Um, and so, again, being able to link this to all of the Center for Whale Research's um, individual-based data, we are able to estimate sizes for more than two-thirds of the population. So, on the left axis, you can see total length in meters across age in the bottom. And you can see the females with the black circles and the, the males with the gray circles. And so we were able to estimate length for the first time for the southern resident killer whales for about, again, about two thirds of the population. But we were also able to show that the whales slowed down in growth. So you could see how these, um, you can see how the um, sizes flatten out after a certain age. But one thing we are surprised to see and I see this circled in the, the blue and the red, is that the younger adult females, when they, stopped, when they stopped growing, they weren't getting as big as the older adult females. And so we suggested this was due to nutritional stress. And if you think back to that slide that John showed you back in the 1990s, where you had those pronounced declines and Chinook salmon availability, this was the time that these whales were really um, growing. And so it showed that if you don't have enough food during these important growth years, then the, the growth will be stunted and you won't um, obtain those larger links. And recently with the northern resident killer rail work, one of the first things that we found is that we found a very similar pattern. And so in these northern residents, um, they experienced, as you showed in that slide with the, the correlated links between the populations, they also um, stopped growing. Um, and so the, the younger adult females weren't getting as big as those older adult females. So you do see that impact of nutritional stress on both of these populations and growth. And it's one of the things that we continue to monitor with Southern residents is, is the growth, especially with the youngsters, um, to see if they're growing like they should, um, obtaining those links as we would expect. And one of the other things, and this is actually, um, I think probably what most people have seen the most um, with our work is that we, we monitor the body condition of individuals. And so both the nutritional and reproductive status. And I show you two images here. It shows you two adult males. Um, and you'll notice that the uh, male on the, the left, and it's actually northern residents, um, you could see how pronounced um, both the thin profile of the whale is and that peanut head that John mentioned is. And so killer whales actually make photogrammetry fairly easy and that you could, they have these uh, nice white eye patches. And so you could see on the image on the left, you could see that the eye patches actually start to, to trace the shape of the skull forming that peanut head. So when they become nutritionally stressed, they lose that adipose tissue behind their skull. So you could see that the eye patches start angling inward. You could see how large those pronounced those pectoral flippers are. And you could see that this whale is just pretty much skin and bones. You could see how thin that profile is. Compared to this animal on the right, which I like to say looks like a, a bloated tick, but you could see those eye patches go outwards. You could see how robust that body is. The pectoral flippers are, are much less pronounced, although they're the same size. You could just see how much more um, robust this whale on the, the right is. And so this is something that we're interested in is, is seeing how individuals compare what kind of condition they are. And we've developed another a number of quantitative metrics to be able to monitor this. And this just shows you another example of this peanut head. Um, three adult females here, L25 on the left, again, very, very robust, still alive. You could see those eye patches angle outward. You could see how robust her body is. Uh, this, the, the center um, is J28 in the center. You could see that the eye patches have started to trace the shape of the skull. This image was taken just a month before she died. Again, look at how thin that body profile is. And then on the right, you have an adult female I-67 from the northern resident killer whale population. And you could see an extremely pronounced peanut head. Um, you could see, again, just skin and bones, how thin the body profile is. This image was taken a week before she died. 
And because we realized how important this, this head area is for monitoring condition, uh, we developed something called the eye patch ratio. And this is very simply a ratio of the eye patch bottom with the eye patch top. Uh, we have a number of publications that have come out on this. And, and so you're going to see a couple of data slides coming up that actually refer to this um, body condition index or this eye patch ratio. Um, and it's definitely become our most important metric for monitoring um, body condition and changes over time. And so this, this will be one of the first data slides I'll show you. And you could see on the top, you have a series um, of figures. You have the eye patch ratio um, on the left. And this is across our entire time series. So dating back to when we did the work with the helicopter in 2008. The images below um, are all of adult females. So J41, J17 in the center, and then J16. And the figures above them, um, you could see that they're highlighted in black. So all the, the gray lines show you how the eye patch ratios change for the entire Southern resident population across time. And the black lines represent the females that you see below. And you could see with J41 on the, the top left axis or the top left figure, um, you could see that, you know, she pretty level for the first part of the study. And then you could see she increased, but we're able to document these fluctuations in condition. The same thing with J17, I'll talk a little bit more about her, but you can see these fluctuations in condition until she declined, until she ended up dying. Um, but again, that's highlighted. We're able to document this across time, really robust um, metric that we're able to use to, to measure these changes. And on the right, you see J16, where you could see that she was pretty level for a good part of the study, and then she started having a pronounced decline. Fortunately, in the past several years, we've seen a, a rebound in this condition, but that was after she lost her calf. I'm gonna talk more specifically now about J17. Um, so that was that center whale that you saw. Again, this shows you the, the eye patch ratio against the left axis, and this is across age. So this is for the entire population. Uh, you can see males have the, the blue dots and females have kind of an orangey. And J17 is highlighted. You could see it's enlarged and it has the black circle around. And one of the things we've been able to do with this eye patch ratio and working with a um, postdoctoral uh, fellow with NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center is we're able to actually categorize um, individuals and, and put the conditions of all the individuals into these, we like to call them bins. And so you could see it's divided into the different um, age and, and uh, sex classes. So we have the calves, we have juveniles, um, we have subadults, both males and females, adult males and females, and then these senescent females. Um, but within that, we divide it into these bins of 20th percentile. So we're able to have these body class conditions. Um, they range from body class five. You can see on the left here with J17, quite robust down on the, the bottom panel. Um, and she's conditioned um, class five, which is the most robust that you can be. And as you note in the top figure, you could see this decline in her condition over time. And if you look at the figures on the bottom, you could see this decline in this body condition. So from body class five, she goes to body class two, to body class one, and then she ends up dying um, 2019. And so one of the things that we've been able to, to do um, is to identify what kind of body class or what kind of condition class these individuals are in. And we've been able to identify that individuals in body class one have an elevated um, link to mortality. And so they're very likely um, to not survive if they go into that body class one condition. And this is really important because as John mentioned, um, the work we're doing is, is sort of like an early warning system. So we're able to identify whales of concern, um, whales of declining condition, and whales that fall into this low, lowest 20th percentile. And that's really important for informing management. And it's, this just shows you, he'd mentioned and, and shown the slide about um, killer whale abundance. Um, and so in that proportion in, in non-poor condition, so this is the proportion of the population that doesn't fall into that, that lower um, bend of body condition, you can see that it's correlated with abundance. And so you can see in years where we have a higher proportion of individuals in poor condition, you can see that we have the decline in abundance that's shown by red. So you have the, the proportion in non-poor condition shown with the, the black lines and dots, and then the red shown in the abundance across the time series. So we're able to use these metrics to link them to, to pod abundance. And we're also, this is really important again for this early detection and working with management groups. 
And these are just a couple example slides. Um, in recent years, we've seen great strides both on the, the Canadian side and on the US side um, to have certain closures in different areas, to have increased protections for killer whales, um, to try to make sure that they can increase both the abundance and the availability of um, Chinook salmon for Southern residents. And this is just another example. Um, you could see that NOAA has requested the partnership with fishery management. This again is just really important. We're able to provide these metrics um, to both NOAA, to WDFW and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And um, we're working with a partnership to try to actually now we're talking about the development of adaptive management, which is really important. And more of the work that I, I mentioned before this postdoc, one of the things that he's been able to do with our body condition data is he's been able to link it to specific salmon stocks, which is really important. I think it's been um, one of the biggest challenges in, in Southern Resident Killer Whale Management is that there's so many different um, salmon stocks that they are feeding on. So trying to link um, our body condition to the specific stock at a specific time of year, and it's gonna be able to really help guide management actions. So, so look for this, it's in press now, it should be released soon. And one of the things that we're also able to do is look at seasonal changes in the visual condition. Um, this just shows you J36 from the J16 match line. And we're able, you know, a lot of the, what I've shown you before has been these annual changes. We're actually able to detect these seasonal changes. And as I mentioned, now we're doing this year round monitoring. So you could see just the change again, focus on those eye patches from September and to May, you see that decline. Then you could see they start angling out again um, in September, 2016. So again, this is really important um, for guiding these management management actions, both at an annual and a seasonal level. You could see again, here's this eye patch ratio on the left side. And now instead of just by year, you see it's broken down and the 0.5 shows the May. So you could see this is for the, the J16 match align. Um, J36 here is highlighted in red, the rest of the J16s in blue. Um, and you could see that we have this decline in condition across years um, from September into May. Then we see we have this improvement and the decline. And so it's something that we're able to, to monitor again. And now we're, we're able to um, collect throughout the year. We just had a, a great encounter with JPOD um, actually Easter weekend. And again, why are, why are we doing this? We're informing um, conservation measures. And so again, we're able to, to look at it at the annual and seasonal level. We can prioritize certain stocks. And we're actively working with all these groups and, and sharing as soon as we have results and finish the analysis, we um, distribute the, um, all of these to our management colleagues. And we're also able to, to monitor reproductive success. I know a lot of you have probably seen some of the images. We've um, had a number of new calves this year, which is exciting. Um, but we're able to identify when individuals are pregnant and we're able to identify um, you know, with a new calf if they successfully give birth, but also um, if they, they lose the calf. Um, so it's something that we are, are actively monitoring for the population. I can show you here an example with J35. Uh, the first picture on the left was September, 2019. She was about five and a half months pregnant. And you could see, I draw the line here. You can look at that, that breadth profile, just like humans, they get big in the middle. And so it's something that you could see that across time here, 15 and a half months pregnant taken in July, 2020, you can see she's gotten much bigger. And then September 2020, when she was about 17 and a half months pregnant, you could see she's actually awkwardly big. They kind of hunch over when they get this pregnant. Um, but those of you that know a little bit about killer whale gestation, she was just about to give birth. They have about a 17 and a half month gestation. And so this is this was a, a very happy story. You could see here's a picture with her with, with J57. Now we just have to hope they'll be able to find enough food, um, you know, so she can support uh, the calf through lactation, which is a huge energetic energetic demand for her and then keep herself alive. But you could see we're able to, to monitor these changes throughout the year. So identify when individuals are pregnant and see how the pregnancy progresses. Um, but unfortunately, um, the Southern resident Kettlewell population has a huge level of reproductive loss. It's been estimated both from hormone work and from our photometry data um, that they have about um, two thirds of their losses and about 68% on um, reproductive loss. This is an image of, of K27 that we captured um, just after she'd lost um, her fetus. And so it's just in a matter of a, 
a couple of minutes that she she came up with that the fetus swam around with it for a little while and then it disappeared and was never recovered. We were able to document prior to this that she was pregnant, but then we were also able to document this loss. Um, most of the time we just see them um, lose that that breadth in the middle if they don't have that um, success, successful birth. Um, and what can we do uh, when we do identify that the individuals are pregnant, um, we can um, classify them as, as vulnerable. And so we work with a number of different groups and, and these groups can ask for more space um, for these whales. And so both for animals of concern that we've identified from, from falling into that lower class bin um, and pregnant whales, it's really important that they have enough space to forage. Um, so this is something that we've done for, for a number of years now after we've identified that whales are pregnant. And for these individuals of concern, again, this just shows a couple of examples ranging from, from J50, you could say J2, J17, who I stepped you through, um, K25 as, a, as another whale we've, over the years we've been able to, to identify, we provided a, a series, a, a kind of a list of, of animals of concern, and we monitor how they, they change over time. So hopefully we'll see them increase in condition, but a, a number of these individuals, as you saw with J17, um, you see this continued decline, actually all of these whales to con continued decline um, until it leads to mortality. And now what we do, is we try to provide um, as close to real-time health metrics as we can. As I mentioned, we end up with thousands and thousands of images and the analysis takes a long time, but something that we're working on speeding up this process so that we can provide um, as real-time as we can uh, to management groups. And again, um, actively work to, to help recover um, this declining population. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna end there. Um, and thanks again for having us. And then questions are at the end. Yeah, questions I think are at the end. I could stop my share. Um, okay, thank you. Wow, thanks to both of you, John and Holly. Um, such incredible work and um, such a different perspective from what we're able to usually see the whales at and. You know, in, in some ways, it's awesome to see the fat, healthy, pregnant whales from that perspective and very disturbing to see the failing whales or um, the moms carrying their, their dead calves or fetuses. Um, it's, I, I was just thinking as you're taking these images that it's gotta be heartbreaking to, to see some of the things that you're capturing um, while you're doing it. And, um, I just really want to thank you both for all the good work you do and um, the contribution to to the Southern Resident Killer Whale Studies and, as we'll see later, the to the Gray Whale Studies. Um, it's just amazing work. Um, we really appreciate you being here today and sharing what you do. Thanks so much. Thanks, Eden. Yeah, yeah. I, I won't take up much time, but you're right. It, knowing these whales so well, it's it's hard to see. But you know, sometimes you feel like you're doing a better job of monitoring them as they do worse. And uh, but but I think there's there's some signs of positivity. But yeah, I appreciate your your comment. Yeah, yeah. It's and you know, as Ken Balcom shares those feelings, as do we, and in many of us watching, and you know, for for those of of you and us who've watched watch the population um, grow and then decline and some of the most disturbing things that have happened in recent years. Um, just thankful for some surviving calves this past year. Um, mm -hmm. And like you say, some hopes for the future. Um, all mm -hmm. we can do is learn and take action and work and hope that we can save them. So thank you for your part in that. Much appreciated. Sure. Thank you. So now we'll um, move on to the, the gray whales in our Sounders population um, that comes into North Puget Sound. Um, usually that's a more cheery topic than <laughs> Southern residents, but um, <laughs> as I'm sure John will mention in his presentation, these past three years, we've been in an unusual mortality event for the, the larger gray whale population. Um, so it's not all cheery news for them this time either, but the, the positive thing is that the whales who do come into North Puget Sound have this buffet of ghost shrimp, and that's um, something that, that sustains and saves 
some of them. So um, we've had John come and speak to our Welcome the Whales workshop many times and to our Ways of Whales. Um, just appreciate all the work um, you've done over the years and decades, <laughs> John. And um, it's been really interesting to see our, our local population grow and just so appreciate all the work you and your team put into monitoring them and identification and tracking and just seeing the changes. Um, if it weren't for the work you do, no one would really even know these whales are here or know that they're the same whales every year. Um, so we just really appreciate that you had this decades of work that um, contribute to the knowledge about this community. And um, thank you for joining us. Oh, that's great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to see my slides. Um, uh, real pleasure. I, I almost, uh, I think both John, Holly, and I weren't sure we would uh, uh, get to do this in person because we've been actually doing field work together the last few days. Um, uh, and I've been trying to work to uh, incorporate some of the uh, results of some aspects of uh, the work we've been doing into the talk today to try to make it a little more up to date. But I don't know if you guys were just came in off the water, maybe you're a little more up to date than I am. But, uh, because I was, uh, it was at least, uh, I don't know, five, six hours ago that I was out on the water. So I'm a little, uh, <laughs> missing a little bit of the uh, uh, activities for today. Uh, I'm going to give just a little bit of background, uh, talk a little bit about the unusual mortality event, but focus on the sounders um, and especially some of the kind of recent updates that I think some of you are interested in. Um, and we've been doing this work for a number of years, uh, but you know, I also work with other elements of the gray whale population. Uh, and just as your you know, quick review that you guys probably know more than almost any audience I've talked to. Uh, you know, I try to always compartmentalize. We have the overall Eastern North Pacific gray whale population, uh, you know, that largely encompasses those animals that breed and winter uh, in Mexican waters and primarily feed up in the Arctic, the area shown in red. In green, you see the area that we call the Pacific Coast Feeding Group. And I'll mention this that because a lot of the focus of our research has been on the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, a group that uh, genetic tests have shown, uh, you know, the haplotype patterns overall are significantly different than the overall population, just indicating there's enough stability to that group that we've determined both with photo ID and verified with these differences and genetic haplotypes uh, that that recruitment makes them a unit that's important to manage and conserve uh, and treat as independent from the overall population. Uh, and then we have our Sounders gray whales, which you see in the inset map there, uh, you know that. And really we're talking about this very small area, you know, right here, cluster of sightings. I can't even remember what I, uh, yes, these are some of the sightings in one particular year. I can't remember which of some of the Sounders whales in this area, but it's generally confined to this pretty small area of Puget Sound. Um, you know, I'll mention that the long-term photo ID has been a key element of our research. And uh, I just stole this slide from something I show with humpback and blue whales primarily, but it equally holds uh, for gray whales. You know, we see the photo identification as, you know, valuable both to look at abundance and trends of animals. You know, for example, this is the trend in humpback whales along the U.S. West Coast. Look at migrations and movements but also to look at entanglement, uh, survival, uh, survival of animals, reproductive histories of animals. And, and we have these long-term studies that we are trying to maintain, not just with gray whales, but also with humpback and blue whales. So we kind of view the, those three species along the US West Coast are what at Cascadia we've tried to focus on keeping a long-term data set. Uh, and we find many applications for that photo ID data. Uh, and our work with gray whales goes back uh, to the mid 1980s is when we started doing work uh, with gray whales. I initially started studying harbor seals uh, in Puget Sound in 1976. 
Uh, but it was in the 1980s that I started to become more interested uh, in some of the cetaceans, especially gray whales. And part of it uh, was because there were, in 1984, there were a number of strainings of gray whales uh, in Puget Sound. I had been studying pollutant impacts uh, on pinnipeds, uh, and there was concern that some of the gray whales that were dying were potentially being affected by what I think one newspaper and quoted one researcher is saying, consumption of a toxic cocktail uh, in Puget Sound, and we wanted to study that. So we started to work on gray whales at that time. And from that, focused on the PCFG, but it was pretty early on, 1990, that uh, we became, you know, first became aware of these gray whales using northern Puget Sound uh, and the area around Whidbey Island. And that's when we identified the first two gray whales that are, are what are we now consider the regular sounders. We've been doing photo ID prior to that with gray whales, uh, but we hadn't identified any of the whales in that Whidbey Island area prior to that. Uh, our catalog has gotten pretty large. You know, we do have over 1,600 gray whales. We're not trying to identify all the gray whales in the 20,000 population. We mostly focus on PCFG gray whales or sounders, but then we get these stragglers that come into Puget Sound. We get interested in some of the whales that are feeding even in spring during the migration. So we end up doing work at, uh, with gray whales at a number of times of years and that's expanded our catalog and database. So identified individuals, we have almost 30,000 encounters with identified individuals, uh, 1,600 of them, uh, different unique individuals, but 322 of those individuals. So only 15% of the individuals account for 84% of the encounters. So what that means is we have, uh, you know, a core group of individuals, primarily sounders and PCFG gray whales uh, that account for the lion's share of the encounters, uh, but they only represent, you know, this small 15% of the unique individuals in our catalog. And the other 85% are primarily individuals seen only once, stragglers that uh, either come into Puget Sound, animals we identified during the migration or in other areas. Uh, we have a number of projects uh, that we do with gray whales. A lot of it focuses on PCFG gray whales. And I don't think I'm gonna get into all of these, but you know, we're interested in the Western gray whales that uh, come through the Washington area. Uh, I'll mention we do work that's gonna be relevant to uh, you know, management and conservation issues around uh, the proposed macaw hunt. Uh, we do work with entangled gray whales. Uh, Jesse Huggins, our straining coordinator, uh, uh, responds to large whale strandings throughout the state, and I'll show you a little bit of that stranding data. We've been interested in the uh, tagging effects on some of the gray whales, and there's a whole little story about that that I wish I could get into, but we don't quite have time to. But uh, anyway, we have a number of projects with gray whales going on currently. Uh, I mentioned the PCFG gray whale study that we do, and I'll just show you maybe this slide. Uh, this actually looks like more change than it is because the uh, the uh, the graph doesn't go down to zero, but these are abundance estimates we generate with uh, Jeff Lake, uh, formerly of Southwest Fisheries Science Center, showing the abundance trend of the PCFG gray whales, showing that really since 2000, so for you know almost 20 years, it's been uh, you know in this pretty 150 to 250 individuals, and that's again that Pacific Coast feeding group of gray whales that feeds in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and that group has particular relevance to the proposed uh, macaw hunt. Uh, now, let's just talk, uh, focus on the sounders for a second. Uh, we do, this has been uh, an, a year where we've tried to do a, a number of different things, uh, kind of expand some of our work with the sounders. Uh, and some of it, I'll show you why we're certainly interested in the sounders and how uh, they reflect uh, and our indicators of what's going on with the larger gray whale population, especially as it relates to this unusual mortality event. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And related to that, you know, some of the data we typically gather, uh, we'll get into the more specialized data when John and Holly talk about the, uh, the Sounders health assessment stuff. Uh, but we're interested in how much they're feeding on ghost shrimp and how that's changing. For example, you know, they're, um, their dependency on the ghost shrimp 
Uh, and how much ghost shrimp they take is a function of how many whales, how long they stay, what's their feeding rate, and the areas they use for feeding. And because ghost shrimp are commercially harvested, those become an important consideration in making sure they have adequate feed, food, to, uh, especially in times like what's occurring with the UME. Now, the deployments <coughs> that we just have completed uh, are to look at uh, how gray whale feeding maybe has changed. We did some deployments of suction cup attached tags in 2015 and 16, uh, and now we're looking to uh, look at some of the evidence that that's changed with what's going on currently in these UME years. We're also using slightly different tags, tags that include acoustics uh, that our previous tags didn't have. Uh, we also have uh, a, a number of student projects, probably the most active of, of them uh, is a, a graduate student at Evergreen, Alex, who's uh, doing a detailed tracking and movements with a land-based theodolite station from Hat Island uh, of animals in that area extending into the Snohomish River Delta. And especially you'll look at uh, not just fine scale and detailed behavior, but also relationship to boat presence uh, in that area because it's a very active boating area. Uh, we've continued some of our work monitoring some of the, uh, the feeding of the sounders on ghost shrimp and the ghost shrimp beds. Uh, you guys have seen this photograph before if you've heard me talk. You know, this is just this aerial view here uh, of a mud flat. Each of these depressions you know, is an area basically excavated by a gray whale feeding at high tide. And then at low tide, these areas the gray whale excavated uh, show up as areas that pool water. Uh, the gray whales are only feeding typically in uh, eight to 10 feet of water. So often you'll see, you know, parts of their body and uh, their parts of their, uh, their left pectoral fin and left edge of their fluke out of the water when they're feeding in these shallow waters. Uh, many of you know of the regular gray whales, and I think I'll just cut to some of the, uh, the, the new data. Um, this is our sort of working graph, if you will. Uh, and normally you wouldn't show a graph like this in a, in a presentation like this, but these are the different sounder gray whales uh, going from whale 21 and 22, Shackleton and Earhart down to, you'll see a bunch of whales with 2000 numbers that are new whales that have joined uh, this area just in recent years. And, and what you'll see a couple of interesting things here. I've highlighted in green, the periods uh, that these gray whales have been present. You know, one of these whales, 53, has been present from the start of the year. I've just shown uh, 2021 dates here. Uh, and, but you'll see quite a few gray whales showed up even before the end of February. Uh, so we had at least four sounders gray whales here, 53, 56, uh, 185, and 723 were all here before the end of February feeding, which is, you know, earlier than is typical uh, for them. Uh, so you see some pretty long periods. Some of these whales have already been here feeding. Uh, so that's been one thing. And then you'll see this number is growing quite a bit. And then the more typical slide I've shown, which kind of shows the progress over the years, now has a number of different rows to it. So now we have individuals by row, uh, you know, starting with Shackleton and Earhart down to our new individuals. Columns are now years and shaded means the whale was seen that year. You'll see a few in purple that are actually PCFG whales that have joined the sounders. So they were seen in other areas in these purple years, not, not in Northern Puget Sound. Um, and you know, a couple of things I'll just wanna point out that I think is meaning from, meaningful from this is, first of all, if you scan down 2020, you'll see how many different individuals we saw in 2020. And this isn't, this is, this graph only shows the individuals that have been seen two or more years. So there are additional individuals that were only seen in 2020. But you can see this list of individuals feeding has dramatically increased. Uh, I think John's going to talk about this, so I won't say much about it. But you'll see 22 Earhart did not show up, uh, one of our few females. Uh, you'll see it was a kind of a bigger gap that she didn't show up. Uh, in the past, we've presumed that 
these were years she might have had a calf, but I think now with John and Holly's work, we have something a little more definitive uh, about that that seems to line up, but you'll see those missing uh, kind of years. And then you'll, uh, you'll also see that similar here, 531, another female that has these kind of periodic gaps, but again, had been seen the last uh, has been seen the last four years continuously without a gap. You know, little hints that you see in here, both with Earhart, you know, and with 531, that these recent years have been tough on gray whales, that uh, you've seen some of the animals that we presumed, uh, uh, you know, had calves not going away and not showing up, neither showing up with a calf nor not showing up, which presume maybe she, they had a calf we didn't see and that hasn't been the case. Uh, uh, I think some of you know that, uh, and I've heard that one notable absence is Patch, whale 49. You can see Patch was one of the animals that we would see virtually every year. Uh, now, that was partly because Patch was a regular, but it was partly because Patch was so distinctive uh, that even distant photos of Patch could do. So in some of the lean years where we didn't have much effort, Often, even a distant shore-based photograph would be enough to confirm Patch's presence. Uh, but we have not seen Patch so far this year. Um, and, and that's, of course, uh, you know, the first time in, in any of our years of work that that's been the case. Uh, and this is at least updated through this morning. So unless someone has saw Patch this afternoon, uh, uh, that's how things stood as of this morning. Now, I mentioned these tags that we deploy. These are these multi-sensor video tags. Uh, this is the early version of what we deployed in 2015 and 16. We're now using a little bit bigger version that has a higher resolution uh, camera, either a 2K or a 4K camera and acoustic hydrophone and built-in satellite transmitter to aid in recovery. So they've become a little bit bigger, but a, a little bit more capable. Uh, and that's what we are trying to add with these 2021 deployments uh, that we've been trying to. And we just have tried to do that the last uh, two days, you know, as I think I'm going to skip this. You know, as some of you know, the video, we've used those videos not only to document with the camera, the feeding, but also to interpret these different sensors we get off the tag, like in red here, this roll sensor that could actually document every feeding event by a tagged gray whale. Uh, in this case, a whale, uh, this red is the roll sensor showing it's rolling uh, 90 degrees on its right side, you know, and doing this, you know, repeatedly, you know, for these intervals and moving. And there's this uh, jerk signal that even shows, you know, where it bumps the bottom <laughs> uh, to begin that feeding event. Uh, and, um, and the longer data that we had, for example, this is from 723 from 2016, you know, showed that they were feeding and the feeding intervals were here, uh, here, here, and here. And here you can see the tidal cycle. Uh, and you'll see basically they were feeding for these windows of time at high tide, but not perfectly centered over high tide. You'll see they definitely favor the rising tide over the falling tide. So generally, once the tide shifts and starts going out, they know to get out of the shallows. And we, we had a whale feeding well into the Snohomish Delta, uh, something on the order of two to three kilometers from deeper water uh, yesterday morning. It really surprised me. It had a long way to go uh, to get back to deeper water. So these whales have to be very aware of the tidal cycle or they'll get stuck there uh, trying to feed. Uh, now, uh, I tried to put these together quickly and just give you a sense of our research. This is uh, uh, our, main, our most successful deployment uh, uh, from the day before yesterday. And you'll actually see this is Dave Cade, uh, who's been a student at uh, Stanford, but now is uh, working as a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz. This is Lisa Hildebrand from uh, Oregon State University. Uh, and. Uh, and here we are approaching one of our known females and deploying a tag on her. We are excited to both get this and be able to collect a biopsy sample that would allow uh, determination of, you know, both stress hormone levels, but also reproductive hormone levels. Uh, and you'll see uh, the deployment here that we'll have, you know, on that. 
This, this crossbow that she's using is a, it's actually a children's crossbow. It's only 50 pound draw weight, extremely light draw weight because we use it just a, you can just cock it with like, you know, two fingers pulling back. Uh, so it's just a way to get a very kind of low power, uh, uh, you know, sample collection. Uh, and this was our uh, deployment on 531 there and the biopsy uh, collected. Uh, and then this is the tag that stayed on a while. Uh, here's the preliminary data and you'll see uh, uh, we picked up this tag this morning. So I think this is the fastest from tag pickup to a presentation. And you'll actually see the tag stayed on and continued uh, getting data past this. But this is as far as we could get in the download <laughs> before I needed to get it to put it in the presentation. Uh, and Dave uh, uh, did this and we see the title cycle here. Uh, and you'll actually see this looks like, again, the same kind of feeding right around high tide uh, that we expected here. But there looks like there are gonna be some little bit of surprises here with 531 feeding. There's some clear, I think, uh, feeding that's probably occurring here, here, and here, so we're going to be a little curious what um, what the once we get all of the data on this tag, including the locations of where this was, because there's a, a GPS on this tag to learn more about this, uh, where this animal was feeding. There's already some slight hints of some something different than what we saw in any of deployments, any of the deployments we did in 2015-16. And John, I can see you there. Are you, are you going to talk a little bit about 531 and what you've noticed? Yeah, I will. I will, John. I added a couple of recent slides. Yep. Excellent. So I won't talk about this slide other than to say this is 531 here. And even though it's hard to see, uh, there's actually a tag in that image. And the tag is right there where my cursor is pointing. And that's the tag on 531 with an image John got. And I think he's going to talk more about that. So I won't say more about 531. Uh, this is another deployment uh, we had on one. Uh, we were excited to get this on one of the new animals. Uh, this is actually an animal first time. We gave it a new number, first time we've seen it in Northern Puget Sound uh, this year. So we gave it the number 2362. Uh, uh, John and Holly, again, were able to get some excellent drone images of this individual. And here's the tag here on that individual. Uh, and. Uh, we have some preliminary dive data, but we haven't been able to process much on this to look at what this animal is doing. But unfortunately, this is a much shorter deployment uh, on this animal. The tag did not stay on very long. Uh, and maybe John will refer to, I think, uh, uh, he might have uh, 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 gotten some interesting observations of why this tag may have come off prematurely. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just going to say a couple of more things. The gray whale UME. Uh, just to point out this unusual mortality event and a few slides about that that sort of heighten why this work with the sounders is valuable. We've now had three, uh, two years, 2019 and 2020, of elevated mortality of close to 200 dead gray whales documented. The true number uh, is probably something in the neighborhood of five times that uh, from some crude calculations of what proportion of dead animals actually wash up and get documented. Uh, so these probably represent pretty substantial mortalities of animals. The 2021 numbers are only here through mid-April, and our primary mortality, at least in from Washington North, is going to occur from now, starting in April, May, and June. So we haven't quite gotten to that main period. Across the three years so far, you'll see the mortality uh, event in these unusual mortality event years. Uh, you can see that uh, there are mortalities earlier in the season, but those are primarily from uh, California, and there's even earlier mortality in Mexico. Our main mortality is in this window here, you know, April, May, June, and then in Alaska is when the mortalities tend to be a little bit later. You'll see the mortalities are documented from Mexico and Baja all the way on up the coast up into Alaska waters, so that's this unusual mortality event. Uh, we were able to respond and do work uh, last year with it, even though with the COVID, it required much smaller teams. Jesse often worked, uh, you know, solo or uh, with her daughter or with a very small team of uh, local collaborators, but uh, uh, trying to maintain distancing, you know, for that. Oh, there, okay. Uh, now, the stranding records in Washington State, I think, represent a, a particularly good 
view of longer term uh, mortalities of gray whales because unlike some other areas, including even California and Oregon, we've actually had a pretty consistent uh, response to gray whale strandings going back to the mid 1970s. Part of that was because we had groups like the National Marine Mammal Lab here, Murray Johnson, we began working with gray whales in 1980, Steve Jeffries of then of Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, there's been a fairly active stranding response. And so I think these Washington strandings are a particularly good indicator, at least of the trends in strandings. And here you see that previous unusual mortality event, 1999, 2000. And then you'll see, here's the 2019 unusual mortality event. Again, just Washington strandings. 2020, we saw quite a drop down, but still well above the average. You can see that was higher than anything other than you know, the 1999, 2000, and 2019. Uh, and, and we're starting to suspect that 2021 will also be a significantly elevated mortality year. So this might end up being a mortality event that goes on longer. Now, how does that fit with the sounders is uh, that now shaded in gray here, you see are what are the years and what number of sounders joined this area. And again, joined as in they came back more than one year. And you'll see our initial six sounders uh, we documented uh, apparently arriving, but you know, there, we talk to people and there are certain uh, people, including Dodie Markey that talk about uh, you know, reports of gray whales prior to this year. Um, and then other sources we've had don't recall seeing gray whales prior to this event, but uh, some new, uh, certainly uh, uh, some of the sounders we're most familiar with joined during that 1990-91 uh, period. And then we had six sounders join in 1999-2000. Uh, and now we've had six more join in this 2018 to 2020 period. And um, what it really looks like uh, is that you can see each of these periods where new sounders joined with the gray bars were all elevated years of mortality of strandings. So in years where gray whales were struggling and uh, we were seeing elevated strandings, that's when we had animals potentially searching for new areas to feed. So we think there's a tight connection between these mortality events and, you know, uh, gray whales finding alternate food sources. You know, most of the gray whales, uh, you know, uh, considerations in the UME that I put out there, and uh, I'll just mention these briefly because I want to wrap up here and, and turn it back to John and Holly, you know, was that the gray whale population has been doing pretty well. It did recover pretty strongly from the 1999-2000 UME. Uh, you know, before it hit this latest drop, uh, there's an updated abundance that I didn't stick in here uh, that shows it's now dropped down with this mortality event. Uh, but it does look like the gray whale population has been recovering and is up at high levels. But we are concerned because there have been dramatic changes in the, you know, Arctic ecosystem where these most of the gray whales feed, dramatic decreases in ice cover. We've seen very dramatic changes in the distribution of gray whales up there and changes in prey abundance in some of the areas they used to feed now having lower prey, but more areas being accessible to gray whales due to lower ice. Uh, so this UME, it's going to be a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think not a simple thing to, to understand, but I, I think it's gonna be an interaction between environmental conditions an increasing gray whale population, you know, and the food supply for gray whales. Uh, that has made trying to measure gray whale body condition really important. We've been having a student use, you know, some of the uh, uh, photographs we've taken over the 30 years to look at, uh, just like Holly was talking about uh, using uh, those aerial photographs of killer whales, you know, to look at measurements. She's been measuring some of the angles along the back well, behind the blowhole, and we've been getting some really nice correlations, both uh, you know, differences between individuals, differences by Julian day through the season and differences between years. Uh, but a key element of this really requires some, you know, more holistic quantitative method of looking at, at health condition, uh, which I think is where I try to set it up for John and Holly to talk about a better way to do that.
Great, thank you, John. Um, and as always, fascinating information. Um, just see the changes over the decades and these last few years during the UME. Um, so thanks so much. Um, and so we'll go back to John and Holly for the gray whale photogrammetry part. And um, then after that, um, type your questions in the Q&A or in chat and we'll have a Q&A for everyone um, after the last presentation. Thank you. Great, so can you guys see my screen again? Yes. Okay, thanks. Well, the, yeah, thanks, John. That was a great introduction. And, you know, I, I'm really mindful of both this study and uh, and our killer whale studies, how we're, we're really standing on the shoulders of giants here. And with a, you know, we're, we're very lucky to have these long-term sighting histories that, that John has with the gray whales, very like similar to Ken's work with, with killer whales, that we can add this, this health assessment component to, and it makes it a much richer study. Um, so, you know, I want to talk about work that we, we did, a, we did a pilot study with John in 2018, um, but, but really we, we, we've kicked this off in the last two years um, to use our, the same aerial photogrammetry techniques I talked about earlier and that Holly talked about to, to monitor the nutritional health um, of, of the sounders and, and the other whales returning to Nor Northern Puget Sound. Um, just to quickly pick up where John left off about the unusual mortality event, the, the graph on the bottom left here comes from the, the group at NOAA that I, I used to lead until a couple of years ago, just showing what's happened. If you look at the gray bar, what's happened with the uh, abundance of gray whales in the, in, the, in the last few years. And, and it's true, there's, there's been, a, it looks like at least a 20% decline in abundance. So many more whales we're assuming have died than just the 430 stranded on the coast. But, um, you know, if you, if, if you keep that kind of 20 to 25% decline in abundance in, in mind, that means that we would expect some of these sounders maybe to suffer the same fate, you know, unless they're doing really well, unless this, this stopover, feeding stopover in Puget Sound is, is able to sustain them. And so it's a really interesting hypothesis to look at. And this is where we, uh, we, we got some funding, um, Holly through SR3 and, and myself at SCA and John at Cascadia to, to monitor the condition of the sounders, the health and, and nutritional condition, both within this current UME and then following it so that we could look at the effect of nutrition driving, driving these changes. So that's the, the context. Um, some of you may have seen us out there on the water. This is SR3's research vessel, Helen, that we've been using both last year and this year. Um, Again, with just as with our killer whale studies, we we use our custom drones, um, a big octocopter mostly that that, that again um, allows us to be further away from the whales and, and to be nice and quiet and carry a really high resolution camera. A key thing again, we use a flat lens on there and a very precise altimeter. Um, we're flying high over the whales. We're not low. We're not disturbing them. We're flying about two hundred feet above them, um, and uh, two hundred feet. The sound of the drone is less than the sound of the waves. It's less than ambient, so they do not know it's there, which is a really cool part of this work. Um, as with the killer whales, one of the first things we wanted to establish is, is linking our pictures to these known individuals. And, and thanks to John's wonderful ID catalog, we were able to do that very quickly. So here's number 723, photograph from the air on the right last year, and a boat-based photo ID picture on the left. And you can very clearly see, see these characteristic pigmentation patterns that, that line up really nicely. It's, with, it's wonderful to have a, an existing photo ID catalog. We're very readily able to match our aerial images to known individuals. Um, here's just a, an example of three pictures on three different days of that same whale last year, 723. Uh, note on the right, he's got mud coming out of his mouth after one of those feeding lunges. Um, pretty neat stuff. But, but the key thing is we're able to obtain these images from the air, high resolution. You can clearly see that we can see differences, or we can identify the edges of the whale for measurements of body width, body length, and we can match them to known individuals. What this allows us to do, here's just pictures of the, all the whales we had identified last year from the air. We're able to um, identify the whales, not just in each year, but each day we went out. And the goal is to look at their condition change through the feeding season, you know, that seems to be an elongating all the time, but effectively the end of February to the start of June. Um, look at what condition they arrived in, what condition they leave in, and how that varies across years, both within and outside of the UME. So most of these data come from last year that John talked about last year. This just shows a matrix of the whales that, that we imaged from the air on these seven different days from early March to June. Uh, the whale IDs down the left and the number of days on the right. You see some of them like Earhart, 
number 22, we photograph them every day. But typically we photograph all the animals on multiple days, a couple that we didn't. And, and this allows us to look at their change over time. Just to put that into the context of John's longer term study, again, these are the whales we imaged from the air in green. Um, so we were able to image two that have adult females that have been known in the area since 1990, number 22 and 531, seven known adult males, and also seven unknown individuals, which these are the animals that have just um, started discovering the area in the last couple of years, um, coincidental with the UME that John referred to. So again, we're, we're, it's wonderful to be able to link our measurements to these known individuals. And I'll come back to that, particularly in relation to these two females. So how we do photogrammetry on gray whales, um, Holly and I have been doing drone-based photogrammetry on gray whales since 2015, mostly on the migrating part of the East and North Pacific population as they migrate past the uh, Central California coast. Um, working with NOAA, we, we, we flew our octocopter drones from shore at Piedras Blancas Lighthouse, and were able to image you know, roughly a, a hundred pairs of females and calves over each year in the last five or six years. These show, these are all females with the the company in calves, and you can see that they vary in condition. The whale on the left is really skinny. The whale on the right is robust. Um, I use this slide to show how we, we, we're taking two key photogrammetry metrics. One is total length, so we can understand something about age, but one is width. And if you look at where those red arrows are, width at 50% of the body length is very variable for gray whales because it's just behind the rib cage. So, so the rib cage you know, constrains how much it can change. But if you measure just behind the rib cage, you can have a very skinny animal like the one on the left where it, you know, it's sucked in below the rib cage or the animal on the right that has a lot of fat between the rib cage and the skin. So it allows us to learn a lot about changing body condition. So they're the two measurements I'm gonna to refer to in a couple of data slides here for the sounders. First of all, length. Again, we have a very precise laser altimeter on our on our drone. Um, it can measure the length, the, the the height of the drone to within millimeters, which allows us to extrapolate from our measurements in pixels to, to true length. Um, not surprisingly, based on what we know about these whales, they were relatively large. No no calves or even small juveniles were present. The maximum was um, just to cover in my slide here. Maximum was almost 13 meters or 42 feet long. The minimum, still big, 36 feet long. To put that into, con these, and these are the sounders measured last year. Um, the, the red dot there is, uh, Ehart is um, number 22, a known adult female. And you know, we know that females are a little longer than adult males, but again, very consistent with what we know about gray whales. Um, this, to put this into context, the top plot here shows the size estimates for the sounders we measured last year. The bottom one is, is data from, from our colleagues at NOAA who used manned aircraft to measure non-calf gray whales um, you know, almost 20 years ago. And all I want to point out is that the size estimates we have line up with the peaks of really the sub-adult and adult whales in, in the population. And we know that from John's long-term studies. Um, calves don't, don't seem to be here. Even small juveniles are not here. These are animals with with experience of the area and larger animals. Um, this is the really cool stuff, I think. And these just show the time trends of body conditions. So what you have here on the left axis is the, uh, on the Y axis, I'm sorry, is the width at 50% of total length. So that's how fat a whale is. And on the bottom, Julian day. So this is the day since January 1st. So, you know, 80 for Julian day is, is, is early March. Um, so what we've got, and the, the horizontal lines join up measurements of the same individual. So what we can see here is that seven of the animals, we had seven animals with longitudinal measures that were measured multiple times. Um, four of those had increase in condition, as we would perhaps expect as they, they stop over on this migration, they, they actually increase quite rapidly in condition. Two of them had a decrease in condition, which I'll, I'll refer to. And most robust was the red line here, the adult female that we measured, um, you know, one of two, but the, this was number 22, Earhart. So, you know, there's not, this isn't a particularly relevant now, except to say that this establishes a monitoring metric. So if we can develop a similar plot next year, to, we can look at things like what condition they're in when they arrive, what condition they're in when they leave, and whether they're increasing condition at the same rate. So these are quantitative metrics we can use to monitor nutritional health. Um, just to dive into that a bit more, um, this shows uh, number 21, uh, Shackleton. Um, and you know that's the whale shown by the blue line that's highlighted by the arrow on the bottom left. What he did is increase rapidly in condition in April and May last year. 
you know, you have to squint to see it here, but our measurements bear it out. These are four different pictures of him last year. And just compare the one on the left when he arrived and was long and lean to the right where you can clearly see he's much fatter. And, and that's what our data here show the, these measurements. You know, I think I was shocked having, you know, spent most of my career studying killer whales that seem to be skinny and, and, and starving um, to, to, to gray whales that appeared to rapidly um, increase condition over a period of just a few weeks. So clearly, a whale like this that has experience in this in this in this study area um, knows how to how and where to find food and increase rapidly, and actually left fairly early. You know, you can see the end of his his line there after day 120 or so. He left in early May last year, apparently in good enough condition to carry on the migration. Um, and so I think there's a role for experience here. Um, here's an, a, a new whale um, from last year that one of the ones that John just referred to have just the, the, the seem to be seen an increasing um, probability in the in the years of the high stranding numbers. It appeared in really poor condition in March. Look at the image on the left. You can you can if you squint, you can see the whale skeleton. Its skin is just hanging on its bones there. This is the whale on the plot on the bottom that's clearly in in, in much skinnier condition than any of the other whales. Um, but it stayed for two months. It stayed with the sounders. We saw it swimming with the sounders, but we never saw it feeding. Um, and what you can see from our data on the plot and from the pictures is it got skinnier over that time. So, you know, I think that we, we need a bigger sample size, but the inference is some of these animals that come in presumably are not in good enough condition to complete the migration. They're looking for feeding opportunities, but they haven't learned to be successful like the sounders have. Um, this well hasn't been seen yet this year, as far as I'm aware. Um, I doubt he made it looking at his condition there. Um, but, but this is a really interesting part of the story. I think that um, clearly during, you know, in that early period around 1990s, these whales may have stumbled on a feeding area that they didn't know about and learned to exploit it. And it seems to be doing really well for the regulars, not necessarily so well for these stragglers that, 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 that come in from now, now and then. But this is a really interesting part of the story. I want to talk about um, the difference between, we, remember we have two females in the data set, number 22 and number 531. 22, Earhart, was the most robust we measured last year. This is her, her she's the, the red line at the top of the plot. She, she was more robust when we first saw her last year. She was really robust when she left, and that's her picture on the right. That's when the last time we imaged her. Contrast that with the, the fattest male we measured last year. That's number 56 on the left, and, and that blue dot is him on the plot. You can see that not only is Earhart fatter, she has a very different shape, a rounder shape. And we proposed last year that this was a pregnant whale. Uh, much like with our killer whales, we've had a lot of experience and feedback of recognizing whales that are a different shape and subsequently they gave birth to calves. So we know what pregnant looks like. I think we're learning here what pregnant looks like in a gray whale. And if you refer back to, to John's histories here, he referred to having these gaps in the sighting record and, and, and possibly that was a time when they, were, when they were pregnant, had a calf, and when they had a calf, they didn't show up as in Puget Sound, mostly because they stayed in the, likely stayed in the lagoons for longer and missed the spring feeding here. Um, so Earhart, this was a useful hypothesis. We proposed last year she was pregnant, expected her not to show up this year, and lo and behold, she hasn't been here. And so we, we hope she's had a a little calf and is um, currently migrating up the coast and ready to go to good feeding grounds in Alaska. But, um, and so that's, that's really cool. I think the, the, this inference we're getting from the air supports John's hypothesis about why there were gaps in the record for some of these known animals. Um, the other female in the data set here um, is Earhart and there's those red that I've highlighted again are these gaps in her recent history where we may suppose that she was pregnant again. And, this is an interesting part of the story. This is the photo John showed just from yesterday and look at her profile. I think it's fair to say that whale is clearly pregnant. Um, you can see the tag, if the tag on, on the whale that John put on this suction cup tag looks tiny compared to that whale. Um, and look at her compared, this is uh, 2249 next to her. Uh, look at this, the width difference between them. Clearly 531 is, is robust nutritionally, but has that round shape like Yeha had last year and is almost certainly pregnant now, fattening up, and um, hopefully we won't see it next year because it'll be off having a calf. Just to show you that a bit, you know, a bit more graphically, these two pictures on the left is her about this time uh, last year, uh, 6th of April, and on the right is her yesterday, oh, sorry, uh, a few weeks ago, around the same time. And you can see, even though the right picture is taken earlier in the year this year than the one on the left, I hope you can see the more rounded look to her this year than last year. So. 
she's rounded um, from this previous picture here. You can see now she's really round. She's really popped out the last few weeks. But even early on in the season when we imaged her, we can see that signal. Um, I love this because I think that if you look at these images, remember these are taken from 200 feet up. They're really high resolution with a, a full frame camera. We've got great resolution for looking at differences in size and shape. And, and, uh, and I think we're addressing some of these key hypotheses about when the sounders are here, when they're not, and why they may not be here, which, which is exciting for us. Um, but here's another whale, an interesting one. I just wanted to show some more recent data. This is number 44. Um, you can see here, this is two pictures from this year, one on the 12th of March, one on the 30th of March. And you can see he's getting rounder, but he's not pregnant, it's a male. Um, so again, it just emphasizes, this is just over what, two, two and a half weeks. Look at the, the 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 shape change in just two and a half weeks. You know, he's putting on putting on weight as a result of feeding well. Of course, number forty four is a whale, Dubnuck, um, who is well known here. He knows the area, knows how to feed. We see him feeding a lot in the uh, in very shallow water. Um, so clearly, he knows how to do it, and he's putting on weight as we'd expect. Um, so these are just a couple of examples of recent data. It shows how we're trying to collect the same quantitative data we got last year to generate these metrics so we can compare years um, and hopefully continue this after the UME um, to see whether there was an attritional effect on these sounders. Um, just to, to finish off, um, John talked about this amazing feeding behavior. We get some stunning feeding images as well. I mean, this is a shot um, of, uh, this is 2259, I think that's right, yeah. It's not patch, it just looks a little bit like patch. Um, and uh, the, look at the, the mud streaming out of its mouth. You can see the mud swirls behind it. It's just done one of these lunges on its right side. It's taken a, a, a mouthful of, of mud and hopefully shrimp. It's expelling that, that water out through its, its baleen plates and uh, just, just stunning images. And I think it emphasizes how these whales have, have learned and adapted to feed in this remarkable environment on, in shallow water estuaries. And as far as we can tell, are doing, doing well because of it. So that's really the state of what we've got at the moment. Um, I was glad to share some, some relatively recent data with you guys. Thank you so much, John. Um, that's, uh, thanks to both of you, both of our Johns and Holly. This has just been amazing. And um, it's great to see some of the metrics of the sounders getting so fat on the ghost shrimp here. Um, that's just awesome. Um, good to have some, some good news in between some of the sad slides. Um, huh, wow, just incredible. And, and I know you've all been out doing this research just in the last few days. So again, we Hours. just- uh, yeah, in the last few hours, <laughs> um, we really, and then John had to get south to Olympia. So we really, um, really appreciate you being able to hop on and join us um, um, literally in the middle of your field week and day um, to share this um, brand new hot off the laptop <laughs> research. Um, it's really incredible. Um, so now we um, will start a question and answer session, um, and it can um, we can take questions on all three of the different presentations. Um, so I will let our team um, of awesome volunteer staff and zoomineers of Amanda and um, Elisa and Cindy who have been working hard in the background keeping things running so well today. Um, so we will turn it over to Amanda who will field the Q&A session. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, so the first question I have here, I believe is probably um, for John with CRC. It says, how do you pick up a tag after it's been on a whale like 531? Yes, and uh, <clears throat> we did it this morning. Uh, on the tags, uh, there's also there's quite a bit of flotation. So when they come off, they'll float, and they float in a manner that uh, exposes to the air two antennas, one attached to a satellite transmitter uh, to go to the Argo satellite. So we're actually able to monitor that uh, and know when the tags come off and give us a general location. 
and then there's also a, a VHF that uh, we're, we home in on with a Yagi directional antenna to actually find it. So we were able to actually pick it up very quickly. It was actually uh, very clearly detectable from our hotel room in Everett. Uh, <laughs> I got the a hotel room facing the right direction, so I was listening uh, and we could hear it. <laughs> Uh, this morning and get a pretty good bearing on it and know where to go. So it was actually very uh, convenient to pick it up. We do lose some tags. I think in some past presentations, I've shared stories of the uh, uh, many hundreds of tags we've deployed on different species. There have been some uh, some challenges, you know, tags that are damaged, tags get picked up by other people. Uh, I even uh, had a bicycle chase involving a, a Chasing, uh, uh, chasing a tag down on a bicycle. That will be a story for another time, but uh, uh, they, there can be pretty interesting ways to recover them. And I find it to be a particularly uh, fun part of, uh, you know, I think people do this as a hobby, go find things, and uh, uh, but we get to do it as part of our work. So we're pretty lucky. That sounds like it. Um, I think this one is also for you. It says, could you explain a little bit more about the correlation between the UMEs and the additional whales showing up here with the sounders and why you think it's happening? What's the theory behind it? Yeah, you know, because part of the, the question, the way I tried to pose the question and think about the question was, you know, the, <clears throat> our area here is, you know, well over 100 nautical miles off the migratory pathway. Uh, of the main population. And the feeding strategy these whales have to use is a highly risky one uh, to feed in this intertidal zone to access uh, these dense ghost shrimp beds. So you have to think what would motivate a whale to do that. And I feel like what motivated these whales to do that is they were desperate. And Dubnuck whale 44 is a case in point. Uh, we first became aware of Dubnuck uh, in very early spring of 1991. And he was down here in southern Puget Sound and he was swimming around into all sorts of areas that didn't have good feed and going through the motions of feeding. And it wasn't until he stumbled across some of the other Sounders whales, Shackleton and Earhart up in northern Puget Sound, that he stopped this wandering and start to feed. And just like many of the very skinny whales that John showed, you know, I think the many of the whales that wander into Puget Sound are whales in, in desperate condition. And that's, you know, the UME reflects that added level of desperation, if you will. That means more whales are looking. And the social nature of gray whales kind of, and the high density of ghost shrimp in these areas, you know, gives them an opportunity to survive. I mean, I think when you look at how long these sounders have been coming back for, it's remarkable. I mean, they survived that 1999-2000 UME. You know, only now for the first time with 30 years are we seeing one of the sounders, 49, you know, patch being a possible animal that's dropped out after coming many years. So clearly when they uh, find this area, they both learn it, return to it, and I think that high survival reflects the fact they benefit from it. And I used to think, okay, well, that's animals learning, but maybe gray whales have this capability precisely because they need to be able to deal with changes in their food supply. And so they're adapted and evolved to be resilient, you know, and experiment and uh, find alternatives when major their primary food sources aren't available and remember how to do that when they have success. So we sometimes see gray whales wandering around trying to feed lots of places. And I always thought, oh, maybe that's just a gray whale, you know, that's sort of deranged, but maybe this is how they discover incredibly productive areas because then if they succeed, they'll stay and feed. So long answer, but that's how I, I view those two as like. Thanks. All right, so this one is for Holly and John. It says, with regards to the Southern Resident Killer Whale Study, what work is being undertaken to restore the Chinook salmon populations to help provide a sustainable food source for the whales? Um, has there been any progress with any of it? And if yes, how is it going? Yeah, a, a lot. I mean, so there, you know, 
of course, remember in in this part of the world, not only are southern resident killer whales endangered, but but there are several salmon runs on the endangered species list as well. So even aside from um, from whale measures, I mean, there, NOAA Fisheries has spent you know a billion dollars in the last twenty years trying to recover salmon, do habitat restoration work. Um, you know, so so there's there's a lot going on in terms of recovering salmon in general. Um, of course, some of that is related to hatchery production, and the, you know the, that's a bit of a contentious issue, even amongst scientists, as to whether hatchery production is good in the long term or not for wild salmon and killer whales. But but things like habitat restoration, protecting spawning beds, um, you know that that that's going on at a, a federal level, at a state level, with, with WDFW, Puget Sound Partnership, an awful lot of work there. And, the and Orca Task Force just gave millions of dollars towards a, a number of different projects, right. including so hatcheries and part and of the governor's task force. There, yeah. There's a lot of work going towards that. Yeah. Um, in Canada, also, um, you know, there's there's you know work going on. I'm not as familiar with it. Now, there's two sides to this, I think, in terms of salmon. There's availability. And abundance, and so abundance. This is what we're talking about here in terms of restoration and 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 run size is a longer term problem, you know, and, and that's the side of it where there's been a lot of long term work going on. I mean, as a society, we want to maintain salmon, and and this has been going on for decades. A huge amount of money being spent to try and maintain salmon abundance. The 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 shorter term issue for killer whales is availability. Right? I mean, even if there's a lot of salmon out there, they need to have access to it. And that's where there's considerations about, you know, noise, noise from small boats, noise from tankers, um, you know, displacement from core habitat, from from general boating, for example. How does that affect the availability of the salmon that's there, particularly when in low salmon years when that might be critical? And so I think those actions affecting availability, the, the efficiency with which a whale can get the salmon, that's where we've seen relatively recent efforts taking place. You know, for example, um, that's that's the backdrop to the, to the uh, new licensing scheme by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife for whale watch vessels. It's the background in, in, in Canada as to why they've got closed areas for air boats or Gulf Islands. So with the and, slide that we shared um, about that. You know, is to, is to just provide quieter places for the whales to forage, assuming there's an availability issue with a kind of precautionary assumption as well, that, they, that, that we need to increase the efficiency of which they can find the salmon out there. So, there are these two sides to it, the long term goals that are continuing. And I think that the, where we're seeing recent changes in the short term actions on both sides of the border, state and federal. Um, of course, you know, it's, it's, I, I believe that what's really important is that for the whales, this needs, some of these need to be precautionary and that we can't wait for 20 year scientific studies to decide if it's important or not to give the whales more space. We have to give them more space. That's precautionary. If we as a society want to conserve them, and I'm, I'm actually I'm very pleased that in some cases we're moving in that direction in the last couple of years. Well, while I have you two, um, I had a question regarding if you were able to get healthy looks at all of the sounders. And then personally, I wanted to know, um, I'm sure JPod has been the pod that you've been able to get uh, better photogrammetry from with them having more presence here. How have they been looking this year as well? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned we were able to get all of JPod um, over Easter weekend, which was great. They're in a nice resting line right off of Friday Harbor. We were able to image everyone. We we're just just starting to get into um, the analysis, but just from um, an initial look, uh, it was actually very positive. I mean, it's something we've actually seen, and I didn't show the um, a slide on it, but we've actually seen uh, condition improvement for JPod in, in recent years, which is actually a, a, a you know really positive for the population. We. One of the things that we've realized with all of our analysis is that we have to look at each specific pod because they do very different things. And mm -hmm. so that was part of like with the analysis that I um, talked about with linking to specific um, salmon runs, it's something that we're looking at pod specific links to these salmon runs to help management. And so, um, but with JPod, they looked, you know, from what, okay. again, we haven't even, you know, we're just getting into the separating individuals and getting into the analysis, but an initial look, it was, it was very positive. And with the sounders that we've seen, um, I think we've seen a few thin animals. I think those are some that aren't as, um, you know, we're kind of expecting this early in the early in the year as well, but for the most part, they've looked pretty good. Yeah. I agree. Um, yeah. You know, going back to JPod, you know, JPod had a, a bad time of it around 2000, you know, 15, 16, when there were a lot of mouths to feed, they had a bunch of new calves. Um, and really, unfortunately, those calves like largely died, J50, J52, J54. We even lost adult females like, 
you know, J14 and J28. And it, it was a really J17. lean. So they were, and at that time, as Holly showed, there was a very strong correlation with poor body condition. Um, what we're seeing now, of course, is that until this year, until the new calves, they haven't had calves in a while. Those mothers that were, were struggling to rear those calves like J16 and J36, they've improved in condition without having an extra mouth to feed. Um, so J-Pod has actually looks, you know, as, as good as we've seen them in the, over the last decade, in the last couple of years. And that's a good sign. Now, the challenge will be again, now there's a new couple of new calves around, J57 and J58, you know, can, can the pod in general feed those extra mouths and how will they do? You know, there's this very like, very much like with gray whales, where we think there's this interaction between the abundance and the carrying capacity in the Arctic. You know, and there's this, <laughs> that, you know, one's coming down and fluctuating and meeting the other. And, it, you know, that determines what happens to the gray whale population. I think the same is true with, Southern residents where, you know, condition, um, you know, depends not only on the salmon out there, but also the number of mouths to feed. And there's a, there's, there's a balance that, that's, that's going to be a bit more, a bit dynamic. And so it, it's right now, Jays look pretty good. And, and of course we've, and, and, and L pod don't look as good. Um, and uh, when we last saw them, but, but that, but that's changed. I mean, that's a complete flip around from 2015, 16, where it was the other way around. So um, yeah, it's, but, but right now we're, we're pretty optimistic about mm -hmm. Jays. And I think it's I think it's why too. If you um, probably read some things that we've we've said we're cautiously optimistic when we see females that are pregnant, and we almost always see females that are pregnant. But it's because yes, you know, you have to have that addition to the population to have population growth. But then we've also seen the impacts and and really high cost of lactation for these females and other members of the group. So um, we're excited to see three. But as I said, hopefully three new ones. But hopefully. Um, it won't negatively, you know, impact the population as a whole. But yeah, it's, it's you know, the, the flip side of that, a K-pod yeah. who, you know, K's haven't had a calf in 10 years now, but they've yeah. been remarkably steady in body condition yeah, during robust. that time, yeah. you know, and so, um, you know, it, it's really interesting to look at that dynamic. So we, we hope we see some calves in K's soon, but and we hope that doesn't lead to a decline in their body condition. But yeah, so it's optimistic for the moment. Well, thanks. Kind of as a writer to that, there was a question regarding, do you think that um, they're finding more food outside of their previous core summer habitat since they're spending less time here in the Salish Sea? They appear to be. Um, On the, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's be. true. The last two or three years, days have certainly been here a lot less than they, they have been. And those two or three years are coinciding with them being in better condition. But as I said, there's, there's other variables at play in terms of, num you know, the demographics of the pod and number of animals there to tease apart. But it does appear wherever they're going, they're, they're eating. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, they, they, they're really good. You know, so that paper I referred to with, of John Ford's in 2009 showing correlation between survival and salmon. What John, the best correlation John found wasn't with any specific salmon run. It was with coastwide abundance of Chinook. And what that really tells, that's really interesting. That wasn't a statistical anomaly. It was, it was driven by knowledge of how they forage. So they're really good at sampling their environment. I mean, killer whales can travel hundred miles a day if they need to. So, um, you know, I think what we're seeing with JPOD recently is, is evidence of that with that they're able to sample their environment and, 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 and find food. Now, they are also creatures of habit and like the sounders you know having found and learned a good foraging area you know the southern residents will probably be more efficient in areas where they have cultural knowledge so i hope they have access and availability for salmon and quiet foraging habitats in those areas because that's where they're going to be most effective thanks so to circle back around to gray whales um i've got two more questions on here so i'm going to try to get both of these squeezed in before um, we break for our happy hour. The first one says, how much do we know about the intelligence of gray whales and what can we say about it? So how do you suppose the idea of feeding on ghost shrimp and the technique is conveyed from whale to whale, for instance? Well, I'll just say that, you know, my own view of gray whales has changed over 30 years. You know, something about gray whales, maybe it's a little bit their appearance, uh, you know, uh, they they sort of had a reputation, I would say, of being having exploited and found this neat specialty way of feeding, but not being incredibly versatile. Uh, and I think what we've learned, and the Sounders are a great example of it, is these animals are extremely versatile. Uh, they're very flexible in their feeding. They're very adaptable and learn to feed in unique ways that I think gives 
gives me a, a much greater appreciation of Grey Wells. And certainly they keep surprising us too in ways that I hadn't expected as well, the, from the studies of the Western Grey Whales and their movements to uh, you know, the distinctiveness of the PCFG whales or the sounders. So uh, I don't know if I quite, you know, how to categorize that, but I would say, you know, I continue to be impressed with the capabilities of gray whales and their resilience and their adaptability and their flexibility. They're not a one trick feeding animal. They've got lots of uh, really interesting tricks for exploiting and finding ways to survive. Great. So the last one here, it says, um, in case this hasn't been addressed, we had someone who came in a little bit later. Is there concern about the supply of ghost shrimp limiting how many sounders can feed in the Salish Sea? Well, you know, I, I really want to sort of commend, you know, especially, you know, Whidbey Island residents, mayor, the former mayor of Langley, uh, Orca Network, uh, at having championed the concern around this issue. <laughs> going back a number of years. Uh, and it did result in Department of Natural Resources, you know, for a while having a moratorium uh, on harvesting in certain areas, uh, you know, sponsoring and encouraging uh, research. You know, they ended up concluding that, you know, the uh, abundance of ghost shrimp, you know, was high enough that it could sustain both the human harvest and the estimates of sounder consumption. But that was based on fewer sounders feeding for shorter periods. And before some of the data, you know, the more detailed data we were getting of how much these whales are feeding and how much they're benefiting from feeding. <coughs> I think we have great potential now to look at this much more quantitatively. But what's clearly changed is we have more sounders gray whales feeding for longer. And one of the more dramatic evidences of it, you guys have seen me and I was gonna to try to sneak it into my presentation, but I couldn't is, you know, are using Google Earth satellite images to look at feeding pits uh, from the images taken at low tide. And uh, if you uh, now use Google Earth, and again, you can do this, it's nothing specialized available to the public. You use the clock icon to scroll back through dates and find spring to early summer dates uh, of images taken at low tide. There's now an August, early August image from 2020. Uh, and even though we had documented in our, uh, our former intern, Nathan, uh, <clears throat> uh, had documented this, that 2020 image uh, now shows a density of feeding pits that exceeds anything we've seen before. You know, so this is in this post UME years and the Snohomish we took <clears throat> the image uh, that showed the highest density of feeding pits on the Snohomish and put it side by side at the exact same location uh, with this 2020 image. Uh, and there were easily two to three times the density of feeding pits in 2020 than we had seen in that earlier highest image. And Nathan and his work had documented some 20,000 feeding pits. We're actually looking at this not even sure we can go through and count how many feeding pits there are because in some cases they're so overlapping and um, intermixed. And also in that, in, in, the, in the 2020 images were also the clear evidence of feeding pits in areas we had not seen them before, including areas like the Skagit River Delta uh, further north uh, and portions of Port Susan we had not previously had feeding pits. So I think that assessment of, you know, how much go shrimp gray whales need, the metrics of that have dramatically changed. And uh, we know it's changed and we have much better data. Uh, and I think it needs to be reevaluated. Uh, clearly these animals are gaining tremendously from this and more and more of them are doing that as the overall population faces these nutritional stresses. Well, thanks. If we have time for one more quick question um, for John and Holly, I was actually curious with you all flying the drones above, you know, both the Sounders and um, Southern residents, I know that uh, you need the most ideal shot to be able to determine gender. Have you guys been looking at that at all as you're flying the drones too on some of these whales that we don't have gender specified for? Yeah, absolutely. We need them to roll over. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they roll over, then we can. Yeah. You know, 
it's true. We we certainly have the resolution to look at gender, and and you know, in in most of the cases, of course, with the southern residents, there's so many cameras on them that that you know, as soon as they they roll over, someone snaps it. But certainly, we you know, we we also do photogrammetry on on bigs, killer whales, on transients. You know, for a number of you know, we've done that since 2014, and um, got some great data on comparative size and body condition compared to residents. And it's no shocker, you know, they're bigger and more and fatter. Um, but um, but with that population where they're not seen as much, not seen socially as much, we've we've been able to, you know, get a number of genders assigned um, and pass those to, to 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 Jared Towers with DFO and 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 Dave Elliford at the center to to add to their catalogs, and so that's been working really really well. So yeah, we're able to do that. Um, and the same with the the northern resident killer yeah. whales. Um, they actually don't have a lot of the genders for mm -hmm. for sub adults and so we are able to um identify gender when you know seeing the ballet we need a good ballet shot but as mm -hmm. soon as you know as long as we have that then we can pass that on so we've been able to help update that information with with jared as well yeah yeah it's a great question so we we're, we're able to do that um now it's a good question about the sounders because so when they're feeding of course for the or not sound the other animals that are here um that we don't know genders on i think it's totally possible we've actually been Prioritizing, prioritizing our for our photogrammetry when it's low tide and they're not feeding because then we can get nice flat images when they're nice and slow when they feed of course there's a lot of mud around and they're rolling around so we don't get good measurement images but that that's the time where i think you'll get a lot more rolling and see the underside a bit and so um of course mo the gender is known by john for most of the sounders so it's you know uh, these a lot of these other whales coming in are not doing that feeding where you see the ventral surface very much. So I'm not sure how much we'd get, but it's possible we might be able to get a, get a couple. But yeah, we, 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 we certainly can use it for that, that purpose. And for other, other species as well, we are able to do that. Mm -hmm. And we have did a lot of bottlenose dolphin work in the, um, down in Southern California and, and now do a lot of small dolphin work and we're able to do that, so mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Well, it looks like I don't have any more q and I've checked the Q&A box. I've checked the chat. So I'm going to turn things back over to Susan and Howie. But thank you both so much for your time um, and for presenting and answering questions for us today. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you. It's always fascinating um, and just really kind of fun to get you all just literally off the water <laughs> with this week's research and new information. Um, and it just, it's great to see this information that is so critical to the assessment and survival of both the uh, gray whales and the, the southern residents. Um, and we really, really appreciate it. Um, and we appreciate all you who have given up a sunny day, a couple hours out of your sunny day. And if um, anyone who wants to stay on for spy hoppy hour, including any of the presenters that want to gather with a beverage of your choice and uh, um, just uh, visit and um, talk about what we've learned and share some fun things that Amanda has put together um, uh, for Grail related um, uh, items. <laughs> I won't give them away. Um, or if you want to wear your fluke hats or see, I'm, I'm using mine just on the back of the wall. <laughs> or or um, wear any of your old parade costumes and be silly. That's welcome also. I know it's been a day of both um, joyful celebration of the return of the whales and of learning some really wonderful things and also some really um, sad and emotional slides and information. Um, and I, I really am thankful we have this kind of day and we can still celebrate and welcome the whales together, even though it's virtually. Um, I want to thank John and John and Holly for their wonderful presentations. Um, picks up, <laughs> picks up um, and all the good work they do. I want to thank um, Jim Freeman for his awesome introduction to our shortest parade in the world and being part of today and being part of so many of our Welcome the Whales. Um, and Cindy and Howard for all their amazing video work um, on the earlier videos we showed. And Cindy and Amanda and Alisa for um, all their incredible hard work in the background. These um, Zoom workshops look 
look easier and are easier in some ways, but there's a lot of um, little chatting and um, dealing with bots who try to get in and destroy everything <laughs> and the crazy world of tech that we deal with um, in the background. And they always just do it with ease and grace and um, skill. So I really appreciate this wonderful team. So we will we'll end the, the formal part of our, our um, day and move on to spy hoppy hour.